my ring. Good morning. All right, it's my understanding that the fence is resting, is that correct? All right, I'm not going to bring the jury out just to take them back in. So when they, after we finish our motions and they come out, I'll let you say that, yeah, okay, let's just do it that way. All right, so based on them resting, you have a motion? And I did receive your memo ahead of time, so I have reviewed that. Okay, I have that, okay. Yes, sir? I think it's just going to be oral arguments. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. Ben Chu for plaintiff Johnny Depp. Uh, Mr. Depp hereby moves to strike defendant Amber Heard's counterclaims because Ms. Heard has not proven by clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Waldman made the three allegedly defamatory statements with actual malice. Right, but clear and convincing is not my motion to strike standard. Un understood, Your Honor. Okay. And we, we have cited the, the okay. standard in our brief. Thank you. Um, moreover, Your Honor, the court should also strike defendant's claim for immunity and attorney's phase uh, based on Virginia's anti-slap statute, as she is not entitled to immunity under the statute. Because we know that the court has carefully reviewed our motion papers, I will just hit some of the salient points. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I would mention, however, uh, Your Honor, that uh, because this is not included in our brief, that there is no record evidence whatsoever that Mr. Depp even saw any of the three statements that Mr. Waldman made prior to being served with the counterclaims in this action, which we believe is relevant to many of the legal standards. And as Your Honor is aware, Ms. Hurd had signaled for the past week that she was planning to call Mr. Depp in her case in chief, and it was our anticipation that she would try to fill what we believe is a gaping hole in with respect to the elements of her proof. Again, there's no record evidence whatsoever that Mr. Depp ever saw any of the three statements about which Ms. Hurd is purportedly suing him for $100 million. As Your Honor is aware, the elements of defamation are as follows. One, publica publication of two, an actionable statement with three, the requisite intent. See Thorp, Thorp v. Sanders, 285 Virginia 476 at 2013. The requisite intent for defamation against a public figure is actual malice. That is, the statement must be made with knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. C. Sanders v. Harris, 213 Virginia, 369 at 372, a 1972 case. See also Jackson v. Hartig, 274 Virginia at 2019. Reckless disregard, as Your Honor is aware, quote, is not measured by whether a reasonably prudent person would have published or would have investigated before publishing ellipses. There must be sufficient evidence to permit the conclusion that the defendant, in fact, entertained serious doubts as to the truth of, the, of his publication, unquote. St. Amant versus Thompson, 390 U.S. Supreme Court, 727 at 731. Your Honor, the evidence shows that Ms. Hurd cannot prevail on her claim because she cannot and did not establish that Mr. Waldman made the statements with actual malice. Mr. Waldman testified that he conducted extensive investigation and reasonably, reasonably believed that the three statements he made were true. Ms. Hurd presented nothing, nothing, to contradict that undisputed fact. Ms. Hurd has no evidence of direct liability because obviously, Your Honor, we need to talk about direct and vicarious liability, but it, it bears noting that she has no evidence of direct liability and cannot prove actual malice by Mr. Waldman when making the three statements at issue. It is undisputed 
that Mr. Depp did not make any of the three statements at issue in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim. Moreover, uh, in order for Mr. Depp to be liable for the conduct of his, one of his attorneys, there must be some showing that he directed, participated, or otherwise authorized Mr. Waldman to make the statements at issue. There is no such evidence on the record that Mr. Depp directed or otherwise authorized Mr. Waldman to make the three allegedly defamatory statements at issue in the counterclaims. Indeed, there is no evidence of any communication or coordination between Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman regarding the counterclaim statements or anything else. For this reason as well, Your Honor, Ms. Hurd cannot meet her burden of proving that Mr. Waldman was acting within the scope of his employment as our, our agency uh, on behalf of Mr. Depp. Again, it bears noting that there's no evidence that Mr. Depp even saw the statements by Mr. Waldman until he was sued, served with the counterclaims well into this case. It was more than a year after Mr. Depp filed his, his complaint and Ms. Hurd lost a series of motions to dismiss that she finally uh, asserted her counterclaims, most of which have already been dismissed by opinion letter of this court. Whereas here, there is no evidence of direct liability, Ms. Hurd must rely on a theory of vicarious liability to hold Mr. Depp liable for the actions, or statements rather, of his purported agent, Mr. Waldman. Vicarious liability is by definition, quote, liability for the tort of another person, unquote. So to hold Mr. Depp liable for Mr. Waldman's statements, Ms. Hurd must establish that Mr. Waldman himself committed all the elements of defamation. I know the court's familiar with this, so I'll try to run through it quickly. C. Parker versus Car Carillon Clinic, 296 Virginia 319 at 332, a 2018 case. Quote, vicarious liability is liability for the tort of another person. It necessarily follows that a claimant cannot make out a case for vicarious liability against an employer without first proving that the employee committed a tort within the scope of his employment. See also Routon Pontiac Corp versus Alston, 236 Virginia, 152 at page 156. Which standard Ms. Hurd has not met? And Your Honor, we cite a string cite citation to cases from other jurisdictions, which we obviously are not binding on the court, but we believe are influential. We presented those to the court um, for its review. It is Ms. Hurd's burden to prove by clear and convincing evidence, or, or ultimately, uh, to prove actual malice by Mr. Waldman, not Mr. Depp. And while it is well settled law in Virginia, as Your Honor has pointed out, pointed out last week, that an agent's knowledge can be imputed to a, pr a principal, and this is the Allen Realty Corp versus Holbert case, 227 Virginia 441 at 446. Ms. Hurd's counsel cannot cite any case law stating that a principal's knowledge is imputed to an agent. In other words, Mr. Waldman must have made the statements knowing that they were false or with reckless disregard as to whether they were false. And Mr. Depp's knowledge cannot be imputed to him. There is no evidence in the record that Mr. Waldman knew the counterclaim statements were false. Indeed, Mr. Waldman did not even know Mr. Depp or Ms. Hurd at the time of any of the alleged incidents at issue, and thus had no personal knowledge of what transpired. And this is reflected in the trial transcript that Mr. Waldman met Mr. Depp first in October of 2016, long after the fact. Nor is there any evidence in the record that Mr. Waldman subjectively entertained any serious doubts about the falsity of the counterclaim statements. Quite the opposite. The evidence shows, and it's unrebutted, that Mr. Waldman had very reasonable grounds to believe, and he did believe, and will to his dying day, that Ms. Hurd's claim of abuse were patently false. Mr. Waldman testified at length about 29 witnesses he believed disproved Ms. Hurd's false claims of abuse. 
uh, see the transcript at page uh, 6008 through 6012, and I won't run through all of that. But his testimony that two trained police officers, Officer Science and Haddon, were called to the penthouse on May 21, 2016, and saw no signs of injury on Ms. Hurd's face, as well as, quote, Ms. Hurd's own witnesses who have testified in various forms at various times that there were no injuries to her face whatsoever between May 21st and May 27th, 2016, when she walked in to court with her publicist, her lawyer, uh, her former best friend who no longer speaks with her, for a no-notice ex parte TRO. Some of the witnesses whom Mr. Waldman has cited, they include Laura DeVenier, Melanie Inglesis, who, as Your Honor recalls, is, was uh, Ms. Hurd's makeup artist, who decided to end any professional or personal association with Ms. Hurd. Uh, Samantha McMillan, Hilda Vargas, Isaac Baruch, Trinity Esparza, Cornelius Harrell, Alejandro Romero, and Brandon Patterson, just to name a few. No reasonable jury could find that Mr. Waldman acted with actual malice in making the allegedly defamatory statements. He was not present for the alleged incidents. He has no personal knowledge of any of the alleged incidents. What Mr. Waldman knows is a product of the legal work he did, the sleuthing he did on behalf of Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd cannot possibly show that Mr. Waldman with acted with actual malice and her defamation claim must fail. Two, Mr. Waldman is an independent contractor, not an employee. It is axiomatic, Your Honor, that a person who hires an independent contractor is not liable for the independent contractor's actions. See Sanchez versus Medicorp Health System, 270 Virginia, 299 at 344. An independent contractor is a person who is engaged to produce a specific result, but who is not subject to the control of the employer principal as to the way to bring about that result. See Atkinson versus Sachno, 261 Virginia, 378 at 284. That's a 2001 case. An outside lawyer retained by a client in connection with litigation is an independent contractor. C. King versus Dalton, 895 F. Sup. 831, Eastern District of Virginia, 1995, where Judge Ellis, a legendary jurist known by all Virginia practitioners, held that, quote, a law firm attorney working with a client is nonetheless an independent contractor and is not an employee of the client corporation. In that case, the employer was a corporation, but the same logic applies when it's an individual like Mr. Depp. That was Mr. Waldman's role. Indeed, clients hire lawyers to obtain specific results, or to try to obtain specific results but they do not control the means by which the results are, are, in, are accomplished. Lawyers, as Your Honor has reminded us, are subject to professional obligations to exercise independent professional judgment. We, can, we are not at the whim of our clients as much as we want to serve them. See Virginia State Bar Professional Guidelines, Rule 1, colon 2, and 2.1. And just to quote 2.1, in representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment, unquote. Mr. Waldman is, as a matter of law, an independent contractor, and Mr. Depp cannot be held responsible for any alleged tort by his attorney, particularly uh, for statements about which he was unaware until he was sued for them. Mr. Waldman testified, and it's unrebutted, that he has, an he has his own law firm. He's not an employee of Mr. Depp. Mr. Depp and, or none of his loan out companies have, have issued him a W-2. And Mr. Waldman provides legal services to clients other than in addition to Mr. Depp. 
and that's found at the transcript, page 6020 through 21. All of that is unrebutted by Ms. Hurd. Mr. Waldman's statements, the third reason for which we respectfully submit the counterclaim should be stricken, is that Mr. Waldman's statements were protected opinion. And I won't run through all of that, but very briefly, taken in their proper context, the counterclaim statements are non-actionable expressions of opinion, entitled to protection under the First Amendment. See Gertz versus Robert Welchink, 418 U.S. 323 at 339. That's a 1974 case from the United States Supreme Court. See also Shacker v. Bufault, a Virginia Supreme Court case found at 290 Virginia 83, a 2015 case, noting that where, quote, all sides of the issue, as well as the rationale for the speaker's view were exposed, the assertion of deceit reasonably could be understood only as the speaker's personal conclusion, unquote, and finding in an accusation of deceit to be opinion. In context, Your Honor, any reporter or any reasonable reader would understand and expect a lawyer associated with Mr. Depp, as Mr. Waldman was, to challenge Ms. Hurd's version of the inherently controversial events of the party's marriage. Just as Ms. Hurd's lawyers were quoted challenging Mr. Depp, and Your Honor will remember the context of these quotes that were in a British tabloid where Mr. Waldman's statements were buried well into article in which both points of view were clearly expressed. And Mr. Waldman was clearly identified not as an independent expert on the U.S. Constitution, but as one of Mr. Depp's attorneys. C. Chavez, 230 Virginia 112 at page 119, quote, the most unsophisticated recipient of such a claim, i.e., any reader of the British tabloid, made by a competitor against another could only regard it as a relative statement of opinion grounded upon the speaker's obvious bias, unquote. Mr. Waldman has never done, never did anything to hide his support of and belief in Mr. Depp. Finally, Your Honor, and for the rest, ultimately Mr. Waldman's statements reflect the existence of two competing narratives and are merely his subjective view about events that he never claims to have witnessed, and there was no doubt about that. Turning to the second part of the argument, which will be more abridged, Ms. Hurd is not entitled to anti-SLAPP immunity. As a threshold matter, Virginia Code section 8.01-223.2, which is, as Your Honor well knows, is the Virginia anti-SLAPP statute amended most recently in 2019, provides in relevant part, quote, the immunity provided by this section shall not apply to any statements made with actual or constructive knowledge that they are false or with reckless disregard for whether they are false. Here, in addition to Mr. Depp's testimony, several witnesses have testified that, A, they never witnessed Mr. Depp abuse Ms. Hurd, and B, that they observed Ms. Hurd without any injuries, marks, bruising, swelling, et cetera, during periods when Ms. Hurd claimed to have injuries, marks, bruises, et cetera. Such witnesses include, but are not limited to, Isaac Baruch, Kate James, Dr. David Kipper, Nurse Debbie Lloyd, Officer Sines and Haddon, Officer William Gatlin, and former U.S. Marine Starling Jenkins. Ms. Hurd's request for anti-SLAPP immunity should be stricken, and even if there were disputing, even if there were disputed facts as to that, the anti-SLAPP immunity does not apply because the defamatory implication of Ms. Hurd's statements are not solely relating to a matter of public concern 
as is required under the statute. As has become quite clear, Your Honor, Mr. Depp uh, is not suing about any of the pub public uh, policy commentary made by the ACLU when it drafted the op-ed, and Ms. Hurd put her name to it. What he is suing about here are the three statements that were directed at him. He has no issue with women's rights. He supports women's rights. In fact, he was the one, Your Honor, as Your Honor knows, who made that first $100,000 contribution to the ACLU, and he made it also to the CHL. Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object. Um, Mr. Chu has largely just read his brief and confined his arguments to those directed in the motion, but like we saw with the last motion to strike, he's now directing his arguments to something other than what's at issue here, and I would object because I think making an argument not to you but to the cameras, it threatens, it's disrespectful to the court and to everyone's time, and it also threatens to undermine the integrity of this process and risk the jury being influenced by outside factors. Well, it, it's his argument. I'll, I'll allow him to do his Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was trying to say, what Mr. Depp is suing about are the three statements. And it's very clear, despite the pious opening statement that about the First Amendment, that with the testimony of Terrence Doherty, and the emails that were admitted as exhibits, that the ACLU and Ms. Heard were conspiring to make it very clear that those three statements were related to Mr. Depp, because otherwise nobody had any interest in the article. And it, it's crystal clear from that. They wanted to time this thing with the release of Aquaman, which was her first film of any significance in terms of uh, popularity. And to do that, uh, that's very clear. So the charade that this had something to do with public policy is risible. And that is not why the anti-slap protections were enacted. They were enacted to protect the rest of the article, not what Mr. Depp is suing about. As generally analyzed by the courts, a matter of public concern is one which relates to, quote, a matter of political, social, or other concern to the community, unquote, as opposed to a matter of only, quote, personal interest, unquote. That's Connick versus Myers, 461 U.S. 138 at page 146. Instead, the defamatory implication at issue in each of the three states, uh, statements at bar relate to the personal grievances between Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard, which does not rise to the level of a matter of public concern with broader implications for society beyond the two litigants in this action any more than Mr. Waldman's statements. I mean, the adding the gloss of public policy might immunize the statements that relate to public policy, but those are not at issue here. Mr. Depp agrees with those statements. We're talking about the three statements that they very intentionally and very cleverly put in to make it clear the implication that it was about Mr. Depp. They had lawyers from the ACLU working around the clock with Eric George to, make, to be as clever about this as possible. And Your Honor remembers the testimony of Mr. Doherty about the consternation at the ACLU when they realized that USA Today and everybody else who read the article knew darn well that this was about Mr. Depp. This cannot be protected by the anti-slap statute. It is a cynical runaround. And I think now that we have the undisputed evidence from from the ACLU in the form of the testimony of Terrence Doherty, who is not only their corporate representative, he was their general counsel. He is a brainiac lawyer. They knew exactly what they were doing, Your Honor. And one of the, he referred to testimony of a woman at the ACLU who said she had nightmares about Ms. Hurd, and he expressed no concern about that. Now, that was either because they knew about, she, that was either a reference to this game they were playing with the op-ed, or, the conspiracy they had to cover up her failure to make the donations. The donations became pledges, but now, but we have evidence that she refused to sign the pledge card. So she's caught either way. Simply stated, Your Honor, 
Mr. Depp is not suing Ms. Hurd for making statements about society in general. I think that's very clear from the record evidence. Mr. Depp is suing her for publicly naming him as an abuser by implication and forever tarnishing his good name, an act that, coming from an ex-spouse, is fundamentally personal in nature. For that reason as well, Your Honor, Virginia's anti-slap statute is not applicable. And based on the for foregoing, Your Honor, Mr. Depp respectfully submits that the court should grant plaintiff's motion to strike the counterclaims and also strike her claim that she is immune under the anti-slap statute. Thank you very Thank much, you. Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. As Your Honor knows, the trial court is required to accept as true all the evidence favorable to Amber at this point, uh, as well as any reasonable inference a jury might draw therefrom, which would sustain the counterclaim. That's the correct standard here. Um, I'll address the actual malice argument first, the agency argument. Your Honor, there's plenty of evidence in the record from which the jury could determine that Mr. Waldman was Mr. Depp's agent. He made those statements. The statements referred to him as Mr. Depp's attorney. As Your Honor uh, ruled on Friday with respect to the jury instruction uh, conference, an attorney uh, is an agent of his client. Mr. Waldman testified that he's been Mr. Depp's attorney since 2016. Uh, he freely admitted speaking to the press on Mr. Depp's behalf, and he refused to answer question after question about that agency, so we can't use that as a sword now. Uh, Mr. Chu puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that Mr. Depp uh, allegedly didn't see the comments that were made uh, that are the subject of the counterclaim. But as Your Honor well knows, whether he saw them or not is not the standard for agency. Um, there's also evidence that Mr. Depp met with the Daily Mail with Mr. Waldman prior to the defamatory statements being made and released. I believe that was in February of 2020, just two months prior. Um, Mr. Waldman also concocted a story that Amber was being investigated for perjury by filing a perjury complaint against her with the LAPD. He disregarded any evidence that he didn't believe would fit in his narrative, that would fit in this story that he was speaking about on behalf of Mr. Depp. And after Mr. Depp lost the UK proceeding, after Mr. Depp was ruled to be a wife beater by the court in the, United, in the UK proceeding, the court there found him to be a wife beater. Mr. Waldman then got an overseas tabloid to run a story claiming that Amber was being investigated for perjury, which simply wasn't true. He walked into the LAPD, filed a complaint for perjury against Ms. Heard, found a media outlet that doesn't follow the two source rule, and then he, he had <coughs> let the world believe that the LAPD was investigating Ms. Heard for perjury. That's a shameful and a sickening example, Your Honor, of the links that Mr. Depp, through his agent, Mr. Waldman, would go to to smear and to defame Amber Heard. And that continued in the three statements in the counterclaim. Your Honor has heard evidence, <clears throat> I won't go through all the evidence, but Your Honor has heard evidence from Ron Schnell, who's traced the negative hashtags toward Amber Heard online associated with those defamatory statements, and notedly noted the staggeringly high number of them that were associated with Mr. Waldman. Under the principles of the agent-principal relationship in Virginia, Your Honor, when Mr. Waldman made those statements, he was standing in the shoes of Mr. Depp. They are one and the same for the purposes of those statements, as Your Honor discussed at length on Friday. Mr. Waldman made these statements with actual malice. There's plenty of evidence from which the jury could infer that. And his own, both from the actual malice from Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman's own reckless disregard of facts that didn't support Mr. Depp and his attempts to manufacture false evidence that did. As Your Honor found in the hearing, uh, I believe it was on March 24th, after Your Honor um, denied Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment, Your Honor said, as to malice, a fact finder could reasonably conclude that Mr. Waldman made the statements with malice because Mr. Waldman has no personal knowledge of the party's marriage and still made the statements at issue. Nothing in this case has changed that. If anything, the evidence has only made it more clear that that is an inference that the jury can and we believe will find. Um, so, Your Honor, there's, there's, no, there's no basis to grant a motion to strike on this agency argument, on the actual malice argument. The evidence shows that not only was Mr. Waldman Mr. Depp's agent, but that the two of them conspired to falsely accuse Amber of creating a hoax and falsify evidence that they believed supported their, their theory and what they wanted to achieve. 
Um, as Your Honor well knows, too, I won't go through all the law, but both agency and malice can be inferred through circumstantial evidence. There's plenty of evidence in the record from which the jury could infer those. Moving on, Your Honor, to the independent contractor, the court's already rejected this argument, ruled that an attorney um, client have a principal agent relationship, and as Your Honor said on Friday, there's no evidence in this case of anything otherwise. As to the argument that the counterclaim statements are statements of opinion, the court has already found twice that they are not statements of opinion, both on January 4th, 2021, in its uh, opinion letter denying Mr. Depp's demur uh, as to the, the counterclaim statements, and at the motion for summary judgment hearing in March of this year. As the anti slap argument, the court again has already ruled at the March 24th, 2021 um, opinion that the statements are as a matter of law regarding matters of public opinion. Uh, the court has already ruled that. Therefore, the only remaining issue for anti slap is whether the intent element of immunity is met. The, as we discussed on Friday, the intent element of immunity is substantially the same as the actual malice standard, which uh, the evidence in this case. Uh, easily allows a jury to, uh, to to find in favor of Ms. Heard on that. Um, I won't go through the uh, the litany of evidence that supports uh, that Mr. Depp is an abuser here, but I'll touch on a few things that relate to Mr. Chu's argument. One, Mr. Chu was totally misrepresenting uh, Mr. Doherty's testimony. There's not a single piece of evidence, Your Honor, in this case suggesting that Ms. Heard and the ACLU were somehow conspiring to uh, achieve a defamatory implication to, to Mr. Depp. That's simply not what Mr. Doherty said. Mr. Chu, feel free to argue that to the jury, but that's not what his testimony reflects. Your Honor, there's also plenty of evidence that's been uh, adduced both in Mr. Depp's claim and in Ms. Heard's counterclaim that show that absolutely there was, that the counterclaim statements are 100% false. There was no hoax perpetrated. Mr. Depp is an abuser who abused Ms. Heard. She did not conspire with her friends to create a hoax. She did not create a hoax herself. And just very briefly, uh, some of the evidence that's come up since the last motion to strike, Your Honor, that Mr. Chu conveniently disregards in his brief are the testimony of Rocky Pennington, the testimony of Josh Drew, the testimony of Elizabeth Mars, all of whom completely corroborate Ms. Heard's account of the events of May 21st, 2016. The testimony of Melanie Iglesias, who testified that she covered Ms. Heard, uh, Ms. Heard's bruises with makeup on right after the December 15th incident that provided ample testimony to support that Ms. Heard often would cover her bruises that were caused by the plaintiff in this case, by Mr. Depp, with makeup. He ignores the evidence of Christy Sexton. He ignores the evidence of Io Tillett Wright. He ignores the evidence of Whitney Enriquez. All of these witnesses and others have testified extensively about Mr. Depp's ex abusive behavior toward Ms. Heard. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, verbal abuse, Your Honor. Mr. Depp's own writings, recordings, pictures, and videos confirm that. The list goes on. There's abundant ev evidence in the record, Your Honor, from which the jury could, and again, we believe will find, that Ms. Heard is not liable for defamation to Mr. Depp, and therefore, by definition, she, is, she has not acted with actual malice, and based on the court's rulings on March 21st, 24th, 2021, she would be entitled to anti-slap immunity, which would permit, permit her to ask the court to award attorney's fees against Mr. Depp. Um, so with that, Your Honor, I'm happy to answer any questions the court has. That's but fine. That Thank, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir? Your Honor, I will be brief in deference to the court's time and the jury's time. What Mr. Rottenborn said about Mr. Waldman's allegedly going to the LAPD about perjury is a complete non sequitur. If they thought that that were somehow improper conduct, they could have included it in their, their counterclaims. They included everything else but the kitchen sink, and most of it was thrown out. There was nothing in there about Mr. Waldman going to the LAPD, so that is a, a very clear non sequitur, red herring, distraction. Number two, when Your Honor ruled on summary judgment on the issue of the counterclaims, Your Honor was dealing with a different standard and a different evidentiary record. At that time, Mr. Waldman had not testified, which is material. Uh, Mr. Waldman has now testified uh, for purposes of trial. We have his trial testimony. 
It's very clear that he did not act with actual malice. They didn't even argue that. So that's pretty clear. Uh, and again, this is consistent. The third point is that it's, it's all about games. They didn't sue Mr. Waldman on the three statements. They didn't try to fill the hole. They've been telling us for a week that they're going to call Mr. Depp to try to fill the hole in their counterclaims. They didn't do that. And it's very consistent with the game playing. Let's go into court after the police have found no problem and after witness after witness who have no relationship with each other said there are no visible marks. Let's not give Mr. Depp's lawyer the required 24-hour notice before the TRO. Let's march into court with our publicist, with our lawyer, with our best friend who no longer talks to her. Let's get a TRO. And when the Me Too folks say, why are you taking $7 million from an abuser? They said, I didn't take money from the abuser. I gave it all to charity. Well, they didn't. I, I don't think anybody should feel bad about them stiffing the ACLU, given what the ACLU did in this case, which is a monstrosity. But she did stiff the sick and dying children. It, it is gamesmanship, and, and that's what she's doing here today. But the law is the law, and they have not fulfilled their burden with respect to the counterclaims. There is virtually no nexus between Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman as to these statements at issue, except for the fact that he is an attorney, and that is not sufficient. In a case where they have not even established that Mr. Depp was aware of these statements, and they knew that they couldn't do it, and they didn't even try. And it's more of the gamesmanship when Ms. Hurd plays word games with Mr. Depp about, oh, I didn't punch you, Johnny, I just hit you. Imagine if the shoe were on the other foot and Mr. Depp, a man, was saying to a woman, oh, woman up, I only hit you, I didn't punch you. And when she, it was chilling, when she warned him on the tape, you go tell a judge, you go tell a jury that you, a man, were abused. See if they're going to believe that. It is an abuse of the system, uh, and she's done it throughout. Finally, Your Honor, and Mr. Rottenborn makes an excellent point, with which I agree, which was that with respect to each of the three statements, Mr. Waldman was clearly identified, even by the tabloid that printed these, well within articles that had both sides represented, that he was Mr. Waldman's attorney. Even the reader of a tabloid understands that when you're getting statements from attorneys, it's going to be forwarding their client's point of view. Mr. Waldman is not the only attorney who has spoken out. Uh, Robbie Kaplan, who was uh, Ms. Hurd's second attorney. So Ms. Hurd started out with Eric George. He made comments to the press. Objection, saying, Your Honor. Again, this is so much further beyond what Your Honor is addressing. I, I'm, finishing up, Your Honor. Okay, I'm, finishing. I'm finishing up, Your Honor. Okay. I'm finishing up. I'm finishing up. My point, Your Honor, and it's on point, is that Mr. George made statements supporting Ms. Hurd's position. Ms. Kaplan made very clear statements uh, supporting her client's position on the merits, and so did Mr. Waldman. But everybody knows when reading those that those are statements by partisans. So for the reasons that we've stated and the reasons set forth in the brief, we respectfully sub, uh, submit that the court should grant the motion to strike or um, in light of the fact that Mr. Depp may reappear, at the very least, take these motions under advisement until the close of all evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. All right, in this matter, I've reviewed all the defendant's evidence as to her counterclaim and I've considered the arguments of her counsel and plaintiff's counsel. Uh, first, to address a few issues that I believe are outside the motion to strike, and that's as to the slap defense. The slap defense is just that it's a defense, so it's really not considered in a motion to strike. Um, having said that, we, I, we went down that legal road on Friday as far as the slap defense goes, as far as the jury instructions. In this particular case, if the plaintiff prevails, it must be with actual malice, therefore, if it's with actual malice, immunity does not apply under that statute. So um, we will deal with that with jury instructions, and we have. Um, as to independent uh, contractor, 
Uh, again, I think it's outside the motion to strike. However, Mr. Waldman was plaintiff's attorney since 2016. Before the initiation of litigation, there is evidence that Mr. Waldman had a certain role during the prior divorce proceedings in the UK case. Additionally, there is evidence that shows his legal representation was broader than just a limited litigation, uh, as outlined in all the cases presenting an attorney as an independent contractor. So the only evidence in this case to this point is that Mr. Waldman was an agent to Mr. Depp, and that is the basis uh, to weigh the motion to strike. <clears throat> as far as the opinions argument, again, um, I think that is outside the motion to strike. The opinions argument, the court has already ruled on this matter as to the three statements that are issued in the counterclaim, uh, ruled uh, that they were not opinion at the demur and at summary judgment. Um, so that argument um, will not be part of the motion to strike. So when assessing a motion to strike, the court accepts the favorable evidence adduced as true towards the non-moving party. The court cannot reject any inference from the evidence favorable to the non-moving party unless it would defy logic and common sense. When there is any doubt in question, the court should overrule a motion to strike. Agency may be inferred from the conduct of the parties and from surrounding facts and circumstances. When there is no direct evidence, circumstances may and usually are relied upon to determine whether an agency relationship exists. A principal is liable for the tortious acts of his agent if the agent was performing his principal's business and acting within the scope of his agency. If an agent's tortious act arises from their agency relationship as enacted in part to service the principal, the principal can be held liable for the tort. Here the alleged tort is defamation. Besides demonstrating the agency relationship, the defendant must prove Mr. Waldman published an actionable statement, meaning a statement that is both false and defamatory, with the requisite intent. As to agency, Mr. Waldman was plaintiff's attorney at the time of the alleged uh, defamatory statements were made. Mr. Waldman does not deny this, and neither does the plaintiff. Moreover, Mr. Waldman made the allegedly defamatory statements about the defendant during the proceedings of this action and interacted with the defendant once the statements were made while still representing the plaintiff. Taking the surrounding circumstances as a whole, an agency relationship can be inferred, and thus, thus a scintilla of evidence regarding agency must be turned over to the jury. In addition, the jury may infer, infer that Mr. Waldman made these specific statements to a third party to serve as plaintiff by portray, portraying defendant as an, oppos, an opposing litigant in a negative light. It is not disputed that Mr. Waldman published statements and that there is a question, there is a question as to whether statements are false and both parties disagree and have presented conflicting evidence as such. As to actual malice, Mr. Waldman made the counterclaim statements after he met with his client. In addition, there is evidence the plaintiff was with Mr. Waldman at a meeting in February 2020 with the Daily Mail online. Further, defendant claimed that she met with Mr. Waldman where he threw the paper containing the counterclaim statements within them. Uh, consequently, there is more than a scintilla of evidence that a reasonable juror may infer Mr. Waldman made the counterclaim statements while realizing they were false or with a reckless disregard for their truth. It is not my role to measure the veracity or weight of the evidence. The Fourth Circuit and the Virginia Supreme Court have made it crystal clear that actual malice is a question for the fact finder. So therefore, the plaintiff's motion to strike is denied. Okay? Thank you. Is there any other preliminary matters before the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Okay.
All right, are we ready for the jury then? Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize, we have a few housekeeping matters to take care of, but thank you. You can have your seat. All right, your next witness. Your Honor, on behalf of defendant and counterclaimant Amber Heard, we rest. All right, thank you. All right, rebuttal evidence? Yes, uh, Your Honor, Mr. Depp calls Walter Hamada of Warner Brothers. All right, Mr. Hamada. Your Honor, just to clarify, this is by deposition, so we may need oh, that. Okay, well, okay. Well, I apologize, I should have provided notice. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you, Your Honor. If we could get the, yeah. Um, what do you work for uh, Warner Brothers Entertainment Inc? Yes, I do. In what capacity? Uh, my title is President of DC based film productions for Warner Brothers. What, if anything, you did to prepare to testify for Warner Brothers as to topics two through 18? Um, I, I did not do anything to prepare for this other than my the meeting that I had with the attorneys. Did Warner Brothers have a contract with Amber Heard to perform in Aquaman 2? Yes, there, there was a, a we, had op, we had an option agreement for her for Aquaman 2. Do you know what it is? It looks like a standard contract between a, a, an actor and, and the studio. And which actor was involved in this? Which which actor was a party to this contract? Amber Heard. Uh, it's a contract for Amber Heard for the for the role of Mara in Aquaman and its sequels. Which studio contracted with uh, Amber Heard? Warner Brothers. When did you uh, come to be the president of DC? At the beginning of 2018, 2018. Mr. Hamada, was Ms. Heard ever released by Warner Brothers from the Aquaman 2 contract or the, what you call the option agreement? No. Was she released from her Aquaman 2 contract on or about February 22, 2021? Uh, no. Was Ms. Heard ever rehired for Aquaman 2 by Warner Brothers? No. Did Ms. Heard receive a pay increase for Aquaman 2? No. 
Why not? Uh, we, it, as a rule, <laughs> as a company, we make these, we go through a lot of trouble when we make our deals with our actors, we get option, uh, we get options on them for subsequent movies. And I think traditionally, um, prior to me joining the company, every option was renegotiated. And one of the things that we were trying to put a rein in on was not renegotiating every deal uh, with the understanding that people come in and make these deals and they have an understanding that there will be options and that there is a deal in place. And there was a big part of our philosophy that we were going to hold people to their options moving forward. But did Warner Brothers at any point in time reduce Ms. Hurd's role in Aquaman 2? The role in the film that the size of the role in the film that she has was determined in the early development of the script, which would have happened in 2018, I would say. Well, so, and from there, beyond normal development, um, the, the role sort of, the character's involvement in the story was sort of what it was from the beginning. Was her role ever reduced for any reason? Um, no, I mean, again, from the early stages of the development of the script, uh, the movie was built around uh, the character of Arthur and the character of Orm, Arthur being Jason Momoa and Orm being Patrick Wilson. Um, so they were always the two co-leads of the movie. Did Warner Brothers ever plan to portray Ms. Heard as the co-lead in Aquaman 2? No, I mean, it was, it was, the movie was always pitched as a buddy comedy between uh, Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson. Was Miss Heard cast in Aquaman? Yes, she was. Was Miss Heard cast in Aquaman 2? Yes, she was. Was Miss Heard paid for her services in Aquaman 1? Yes. Was Miss Heard paid for her services in Aquaman 2? Yes. Was her compensation for Aquaman 2 affected in any way by anything said by Johnny Depp? No. Was her compensation for Aquaman 2 affected by anything said by Adam Waldman? No. Was her compensation for Aquaman 2 affected by anything said by anybody representing Johnny Depp? No. Was there any delay in Warner Brothers exercising the option to cast Miss Heard in Aquaman 2? Uh, yes, there was. How long a delay was there? Um, I don't know, probably weeks. What was the cause of the delay? Uh, there were conversations about potentially recasting. Who was the producer? Uh, Peter Safran. Who was the director? Uh, James Wan. Did Warner Brothers believe that those concerns were legitimate? Uh, yeah, I mean, I had no reason not to believe the director and the producer of the movie. And you are testifying today as a representative of Warner Brothers, correct? Yes, I am. What, if any, creative concerns did Warner Brothers have about casting Amber Heard as Mira in Aquaman 2? This is the concerns that were brought up uh, at the wrap of the first movie, production of the first movie, which is the issue of chemistry. Did the two have chemistry? Um, you know, I think editorially they were able to, to make that relationship work in the first movie, but there was a concern that it took a lot of effort to get there. And would we be better off recasting, finding someone who had better, more natural chemistry with Jason Momoa uh, and move forward that way? Did Warner Brothers... Uh, take any steps affirmatively to audition other actresses for the role of Mira in Aquaman 2? No, we did not. 
Other than the creative concerns and concerns about chemistry you testified about, was there any other reason Warner Brothers delayed in picking up Ms. Herbert's option for Aquaman 2? No, it was all it was all concerns about whether she was the right bit of casting for the movie. What role, if any, did Ms. Hurd's dispute with Johnny Depp have in Warner Brothers' delay picking in picking up Ms. Hurd's option for Aquaman 2? There was there was none from our end. At any point in time, was Warner Brothers considering paying Ms. Hurd more money for Aquaman 2 than is set forth in the option contract you previously identified? No. As I said, we, we, were, we were determined to hold our actors to their option agreements. Would Warner Brothers have paid Ms. Hurd more money on Aquaman 2 if it had picked up her option earlier? No. At any time from the beginning of history through today, did Warner Brothers ever release Ms. Hurd from the Aquaman 2 contract? No. At any point in time from the beginning of history to today, did Warner Brothers rehire Ms. Hurd for Aquaman 2? No, because we just picked up her option. And when is the last time you spoke with Rob Cohen relating in any manner to whether to exercise the option on Amber Hurd for Aquaman 2? No, it would have been the same time that I was having those conversations with Peter Safran in 2020. Did you speak with Zack Snyder at all relating to whether to exercise the option for Amber Hurd on Aquaman 2? No, I've not had any conversations with Zack Snyder. Did you speak at all with Jason Momoa in preparation for your deposition today? No. Have you ever spoken with Jason Momoa about any issues relating to chemistry between he and Amber Hurd? Yes. When did you speak with Jason Momoa about chemistry issues between he and Amber Hurd? It would have been in that same time period where we were prior to green light of the movie. Now, you were asked some questions about scripts. Did you review any of the drafts of the script for Aquaman 2? Yes. When? Part of my role is I read all the drafts of the scripts as they come in. When was the first script for Aquaman 2? Oh, boy. I cannot tell you. Probably in 2018, the latter part of 2018 would be my guess. And how many versions of the script had been written by the beginning of 2021 for Aquaman 2? Oh, there were probably half a dozen drafts of the script. All right. What, if anything, did Rob Cowan say to you about chemistry? What specifically about the chemistry between Amber Hurd and Jason Momoa? Just the fact that they didn't really have a lot of chemistry together. You know, the reality is it's not uncommon on movies for two leads to not have chemistry and that it's sort of movie magic and editorial, the ability to sort of put performances together and with the magic of, you know, a great score and how you put the pieces together, you can fabricate sort of that chemistry. And so I think at the end of the day, I think if you watch the movie, they look like they had great chemistry. But I just know that through the course of the post-production that it took a lot of effort to get there. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's very easy. You just put the, you know, characters on the screen together and they work. And sometimes it's harder. And so... Can you give me anything more specific about what it was with Amber Hurd and Jason Momoa that was difficult for the chemistry? 
No, because it's 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 like what makes a movie star a movie star. Like you 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 know it when you see it, and the chemistry wasn't there. Now you've used the term fabricated a number of times. What did you do to fabricate the chemistry between Amber Heard and Jason Momoa? Well, those are just it, it, it's editorial. It, it, a good editor and a good filmmaker can pick the right takes, can pick the right moments, and put scenes together. Again, score is a big, you know, the music in a scene makes a big difference. You can make a happy scene feel sadder or a sad scene feel happier. Uh, and so it was sort of the, it's 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 just the magic of post-production, um, editing, sound, sound design, music, et cetera. And what, what do you mean by fabricating, though? I mean, were they literally falsifying or were they no. just picking the best no. music? Let me just let me finish my question. Um, were they picking the best music and picking the best looks because that's their job and that's what you do on every scene? That, that is what we do in, in post-production. That's what filmmakers do. They, they, no, they, yeah, they, 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 this is on any production you're doing that. You're, you're putting performances together. Sometimes it's either easier than others. Uh, this one uh, was more difficult um, because of the lack of chemistry between, between the two. Um, but they were able to, James Wan and the editor were able to get it to a place where the end result actually works. And it's great. And, and in fact, that's the job of every filmmaker, right? Is to put all of the course. combinations together to make the most successful production? Absolutely. I'll tell you what has been marked as uh, exhibit number five. It's ALH 18247. And this is a text message exchange between James Wan and Amber Heard. And you mentioned James Wan was the director of Aquaman 2, is that correct? And Aquaman, That's correct. And Aquaman, the first one, correct? That's correct. All right. And uh, James is texting to Amber on August 25, 2018, you rated really high with the audience, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Do you see that? Yes. This is August 25, 2018. What's going on on August 25, 2018 that would cause the director to send a, a text message to Amber saying... Um, that would be a test screening. We, so during our post-production of movie, we test the movie with an audience, and the audience tells us what they liked and what they didn't like. Uh, and so that's what he's referring to there. And they really liked Amber Heard, correct? Yes, she did. She tested well. It hit a billion dollars, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And more specifically, did you play any role in the determination to communicate to Amber's representatives that Warner Brothers was considering not exercising her option? Um, yeah, probably in the sense of we had the conversations, and I believe, if I recall, we had uh, that's where Peter Safran offered to reach out to the agent uh, and express where, which direction we were leaning. Have you seen any document that says there was any chemistry issues between Amber Heard and Jason Momoa in Aquaman 1? Documents? No, I mean, those were all conversations. But if Jason came back and James Wan came back, you were guaranteeing that Amber Heard would play Mira, correct? That's correct. Okay. And Jason Momoa uh, was able to negotiate a different, uh, a, a different compensation structure was he not for Aquaman too? That's true. He did. He did renegotiate. Now Aquaman was the <coughs> highest grossing DC film ever for Warner Brothers, was it not? Yes, it was. And what, if any, issues did you have with Amber Heard in Aquaman too? Uh, my understanding is actually the production went very smoothly. All right, thank you. Your next witness. Your Honor, we call uh, Dr. Colburn next, but I know we have a preliminary matter that we need to deal with briefly, if we may approach. Sure.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize again. We have a few things to take care of. We're just going to go ahead and take our morning recess now for 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not talk to anybody, okay? Do not do any outside research. Sorry, that was the same thing. If the doctor testifies, then is that WebEx? Yeah. Okay, so I'll get that set up too while we take the break as well. All right, and all right we'll go ahead and take a break. Let's make it 10.50 to give him time to look at everything, okay? Thank you, Thank you. All right.
Yes. We ready for the jury? Yes. Okay. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you count to five for me? One, two, three, four, five. All right. I'm just trying to get you on the big screen. We're waiting for the jury. Just give us a minute. Okay, sir. Thank you. Can be seated. All right, your next witness. Uh, we called Dr. Colbert. All right, sir, if you could raise your right hand. Do you swear for him to tell the truth under penalty of law? Yes. Your Honor, I would just object that Dr. Colbert appears to have a stack of documents right in front of him. All right, sir, you can put your hand down and any documents you have, if you could put them away and just testify from your memory. Okay, sir? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, your question. Good morning, Dr. Colbert. Good morning. Could you please state your full name for the record? 
David Allen Colbert. And what is your profession? I'm a plastic and hand surgeon. And how long have you been a plastic and hand surgeon? Been in practice for 26 years. Where do you currently work? At Cedars Sinai Medical Center. How long have you worked there? For the past 26 years. Do you know the plaintiff in this action, Johnny Depp? I do. And how do you know Mr. Depp? I had taken care of him when he had injured his hand. When did Mr. Depp become your patient? Sometime in March of 2015. And what type of treatment did you provide to Mr. Depp? He had a fracture of his finger with soft tissue loss. And so um, we reconstructed his finger. When did you perform, perform the first surgery on Mr. Depp's finger? I believe it was around March 20th of 2015. And what was involved in that surgery, just briefly? Debreeding the devitalized tissue, putting a hypothene or skin graft, store some of the soft tissue loss that he had, and then also putting a pin in because he had a displaced distal phalanx fracture. What was the state of Mr. Depp's hand immediately after that surgery? I'm sorry, I think the audio cut out a little bit. Could you please repeat your answer? It, it was injured and um, had soft tissue loss and a fracture of his distal phalanx. And what type of cast was on Mr. Depp's hand after you performed that surgery? It was a plaster splint. And can you please describe to the jury what, what a plaster splint would look like? So it's, it's like a cast, but you don't want to put everything circumferential on it because of swelling after surgery. So and believe in Mr. Depp's case, it was like the two fingers. I think the third finger was the one that was operated on. So these two fingers, the third and fourth finger are together. And it's a splint with plaster on the top and on the bottom that goes um, around the hand uh, to protect it. How mobile was Mr. Depp's hand when it was in that cast? Well, he couldn't move his third and fourth fingers because of the bulkiness of the splint. Typically, postoperatively, it's a more bulkier splint right after the surgery. So it's uh, not very, um, it gets in the way. Could Mr. Depp grab someone with that cast on his hand? <clears throat> I could, I, he could attempt to grab someone. I don't know how successful he would be. He, he had his index finger free and his thumb free, but the other fingers were um, probably not being able to move. How long was the pin in Mr. Depp's finger? About 11 or 12 days. And how was the pin removed? It was removed under local anesthesia in my office. How long did you ultimately treat Mr. Depp for his hand injury? For several months. And why was that? It was a bad injury. And it required a few more little office procedures to clean up the tissue. He had an infection uh, as a result of the injury, so he had to be on antibiotics for some time until it finally completely healed. Do you recall when the infection developed? It was a few weeks after the surgery, and that's when I took out the pin. When was the last time that you saw Mr. Depp? 
uh, sometime in 2015. I don't recall when. And when was the last time that you spoke to Mr. Depp? The same. Around 2015. Right. Thank you, Dr. Colburn. All right, cross examination. Good morning, Dr. Culver. So you said that this plaster splint was put on, on after surgery on March 20th, 2015? Yes. And the, a, plaster, the plaster, yeah. a plaster splint, is, is that sometimes called half a cast? Sometimes it's called half a cast or a soft cast, something like that, yeah. And it's, it's made of plaster of Paris, right? Correct. And plaster of Paris hardens like a cast does, correct? Yes. So other than the fact that it's a little smaller than a cast that goes around your whole hand, it's just as hard as a cast that would be put on a broken arm or a broken hand, correct? Well, it's softer on the side so the fingers can expand for swelling. So it's not fully, the plaster appears circumferential around everything. So there are areas that are softer to allow for swelling. But the parts that are covered with plaster of Paris are just as hard as any other cast, correct? Correct. And regardless of whether Mr. Depp could have grabbed someone with the hand with the cast on, he. He could have grabbed someone with the hand without the cast on, correct? Correct. Michelle, can you pull up exhibit 400, please? This has been admitted, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> Permission to publish? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Culber, I'm just going to ask um, Michelle here to just scroll through these pictures, and I'd ask you to take a look at them. Your Honor, I'm going to object for lack of foundation for these photographs. They're already in evidence. I, I, with respect to the questions to the witness. They're in evidence. Thank you. Michelle, if you could go back up to that. Stop right there. Is there anything about the cast that was put on Mr. Depp's hand on March 20th, 2015 that would have prevented him from doing this damage to Ms. Hurd's closet on March 23rd, 2015? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. I mean, he had his other hand available, so. No further questions, thank you. All right, redirect. Dr. Colbert, how many fingers were in the plaster portion of, the, of Mr. Depp's cast? I believe two or three. At least two were. And the third one and the fourth one. And why, why did you call it a soft cast? Because it's not fully, plaster doesn't go around the entire uh, hand because you allow for swelling. So there's plaster to protect the uh, fracture. So there's a little plaster on it, but it's on the top and the bottom, but it's not completely circumferential. So there's soft spots to it. And, and where are those soft spots located again? Usually we put a piece of plaster underneath the fingers and on top, and then the sides of the fingers, it's soft so that the fingers can swell after the surgery. Could Mr. Depp have hit someone with the hand that had the cast on it? He could have hit someone with it. It probably would have um, injured, damaged the cast. Did you ever notice any damage to Mr. Depp's cast when you treated him after the surgery? I, I don't recall. That's not, not nothing that comes to mind. Could Mr. Depp uh, form a fist with, with the cast on? No. No further questions. 
Thank um, you, Dr. Kohler. All right, thank you, sir. That concludes your testimony. Thank you. All right, your next witness. Mm -hmm. Plaintiff calls Richard Marks, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Marks. So just a reminder that you're. Just give us a second, and see. No, sir, you've already just reminded that you're still under oath. Okay, sir. Oh. Morning, sir. Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. Welcome back, Mr. Marks. Um, you've testified in this case previously, but would you just um, briefly remind the jury who you are? I'm uh, Richard Marks, and uh, I'm a uh, full-time entertainment transactional attorney. I make deals uh, every day for productions and for individuals. I'm in the trenches negotiating and then making sure the contracts reflect the deals, um, and I'm very much distinguished from uh, the other side's expert who is not an attorney, who's not in the trenches making deals, is not in that day-to-day -day process. And are you familiar with the testimony of um, Catherine Arnold in this matter? Yes. Have you been asked to analyze that testimony and provide opinions in response? Yes. And generally, what are those opinions? Well, my, my opinions are that um, uh, she's very uh, slick and smooth, uh, but she's not an expert in deal making. Uh, her assessment of damages is built on nothing, and it's wildly speculative. Are you familiar with Ms. Arnold's opinion that it's customary for an actor to renegotiate the fee for a subsequent picture option in a multi-picture contract when a film is successful? Yes, I heard that opinion. And are you also familiar with her testimony that under those circumstances, an actor will renegotiate a 50 to 100% increase in their salary for the next optional film? Yes, I heard her say that. Do you agree with those opinions? Absolutely not. Why not, sir? Well, what we're dealing with in this case is a test option agreement. And that's an, uh, an agreement, uh, it's a multi-picture agreement, and it's the nightmare for people like me. You, the test is going to take place, let's say, for 10 actors the next morning at 9, and you have to fully negotiate a contract that might cover four movies and have it signed before they're allowed to test so that if they're chosen for the part, we have the full contract. There's no renegotiation. So you've got a contract for a multi-picture deal. It's usually a franchise. Uh, and uh, you negotiate the first movie. And normally, if they get the part, they're the chosen one, uh, they're the stars born moment, if you will. Uh, they get the part, normally their salary is um, uh, inflated from their normal salary because now they're going to play a character that could go on for four movies. In this case, uh, Ms. Hurd's first salary when she got the part was $450,000. If Warner Brothers and DC Comics decided to make a next movie, um, they could recast her. They had no obligation. All they had was an option. But if they did cast her up front that they had uh, agreed to more than double her salary, like two and a quarter times to get to the million dollars, 
Uh, these are large uh, bumps, if you will. They're, if an actor is on a series, say, they go, and they have five options, they go up in increments of 5%, 10%, 20%, not these multiples that you see in uh, uh, a test option agreement. And that's one of the reasons that uh, they aren't renegotiated normally. They are in some instances, but not normally. What's the significance of the test part in a test option agreement? Uh, the, the test significance is that an established actor usually wouldn't test. They'd be offered the role. The, uh, Ms. Heard was in a group of actors that needed to be tested to see if the studio wanted to hire them. And then if they hired them, uh, they would be locked up for potentially four movies at very lucrative uh, increases because out after Aquaman uh, 1, she gets to a million dollars, Aquaman 2, she gets to two million dollars, and Aquaman 4, uh, 3, excuse me, you get to four million dollars. These are unheard of bumps if you're going on a normal career and trying to increase your salary by increments. In your experience, what is customary for negotiations of multi-picture deals? Uh, well, I think what happened in this case was customary for negotiation of multi-picture deals. Um, and by that, I mean that you assume success. The reason you go from the first Justice League movie where uh, Miss Heard played Mira the first time. The reason you more than double her salary is you assume success. So you've already built in uh, the bonus that uh, Miss Arnold was referring to, a renegotiation, if you will, for the third movie. Instead of doubling her salary, Miss Arnold said it would only be fair to quadruple her salary. Um, and that's just not the way these idiosyncratic contracts work. They're a very small portion of the contracts we deal with. Are you familiar with Ms. Arnold's opinion that Ms. Heard's salary for Aquaman 2 could have been renegotiated to around $4 million? I am. Do you agree with that opinion? No. Why not? Well, as I've said, that would now be after a healthy first payday it's more than doubled, and now it would be quadrupled. That's not the way it happens. Um, Walter Hamada, who is the president of the that part of the studio, said it doesn't happen. They're not going to do it. Um, Miss Arnold, for some substance, says, well, uh, Jason Momoa got to do it, but she doesn't give us any of the details. We know that Jason Momoa uh, was in a movie uh, uh, before the Justice League. He played Aquaman in a movie not opposite, not with Miss, Miss Mira in that movie. So he had a history before the first movie with Amber Heard. He played Aquaman. We don't know what his contract, the state of it was when you got to Aquaman 2. And she says, unsupported, that he renegotiated. We're not sure what he renegotiated to. But I can say that at the end of the option period, when you've only got one option left, and you want that star in more movies, uh, you may renegotiate, but it's not a, a, a gratuity. It's, we'll give you more for the last option if you'll give us three more options. Uh, it's a give and take. And unfortunately, Ms. Arnold didn't give us any of that background uh, or those building blocks. And then I think yesterday she said, and the other actors renegotiated. And again, we don't know their salary history. We don't know their contracts. We don't know anything uh, except she's asking you just to believe her as what I refer to as a, a professional expert. 
Are you aware that Ms. Arnold's opined that but for the alleged defamatory statements by Mr. Waldman, Ms. Heard would have earned $45 million in the last 18 months and then the next three to five years? Yes, I am. Um, I'd like to address some of the components of that um, one by one with you, Mr. Marks. Are you familiar with her testimony that Ms. Heard would continue to make films um, for approximately $4 million each following Aquaman 2? Yes. Do you agree with that testimony? No. Why not? Well, again, in Aquaman 2, uh, she, uh, Amber Heard has already had this huge increase. She worked on Aquaman 2 for $2 million. What uh, Ms. Arnold is saying is, oh, she should have worked on it for $4 million, uh, which I disagree with, and I, I don't... I think there's, there is reasons to negotiate that weren't here in this case. So the $4 million I have a disagreement with, but even if it was at $4 million, or if it was at $2 million, the, the four or five movies that uh, Ms. Heard might get might be independent movies. They may, might be standalone studio movies. They might be passion projects. Every actor has a, has, yeah, a, a quiver full of quotes, and their highest quote is for the superhero um, fantasy uh, a journey, uh, their lowest quote might be for the independent passion project where they'll, they'll defer their salary and almost take nothing to work, just SAG minimum. Uh, and uh, to assume that she'd get four or five more movies at this, her last fantasy quote would be to assume that those are also those type of movies, playing another character. And uh, Ms. Arnold says that, that uh, Ms. Hurd's breakout moment, her, her star is born moment, is Christmas 2018. If that's true, and I don't think it's true, those moments no, don't normally happen to supporting cast, but if it's true, as a deal maker, you would expect if you represent a producer's production companies, to flock in, to take advantage of this hot star and to sign them up. And we have from Christmas 2018 to spring 20, where there, there is none of this activity. The, the star is born phenomena didn't happen. Uh, Miss Heard starred in one series of eight episodes and she earned a healthy fee, $200,000 an episode. But that's five times less than the million uh, Miss Arnold is tossing out, supposedly based on Jason Momoa's quote, she doesn't prove it or, or give us facts. And Jason Momoa is not a comparable actor. He's been in a series where they shot 78 episodes, 44 episodes, 21 episodes. He played Conan the Barbarian. He was in Game of Thrones. Objection. It's not a objection, comparable. Your Honor, I'm unresponsive to. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Mr. Marks, we'll, we'll get to some of those um, issues in a moment, but um, I want to take you back for a second. I believe you testified a few minutes ago that um, your understanding is that the last option in a multi picture deal might be renegotiated under some circumstances. Do you have an understanding of whether um, Aquaman 2 was the last? option in Ms. Hurd's contract with Warner Brothers? Oh, no, no. Uh, Aquaman 2 has not even been released, and Warner Brothers has a fourth option for Aquaman 3 or another movie where Mira appears, that character, and they've agreed to double the salary again. So it's in success, and that assumes that they recast and that they make the movie. Are you aware of Ms. Arnold's testimony that Ms. Hurd would have made several million dollars on endorsement deals, um, such as the one she had with L'Oreal? I'm aware of that testimony. Do you agree with that opinion? No. Why not? Again, this is a business of personalities. Uh, we didn't, after the breakout moment that Ms. Arnold talked about, Christmas 2018, we didn't see endorsement deals flocking to uh, Ms. Hurd uh, during that 16-month period before 
Adam Waldman made a few statements in uh, the London Daily Mail, I believe it was. We didn't see those endorsements coming to her. We didn't, uh, what Ms. Arnold shows you is these non-comparable actors, they had endorsement deals, but she doesn't show you when she describes the breakout moment and why she's comparing Amber Heard to these, what I call, uncomparable actors, but she's making the comparison. She's saying, well, they had all these deals. Why wouldn't she? But for the statements that happened 16 months later, and I guess my primary question is what happened in the 16 months, even if you believe three statements in the Daily Mail uh, are the stake through the heart of this uh, stars born moment. Do you have an opinion about Ms. Arnold's testimony that Ms. Heard would have made $1 million an episode um, in a couple of streaming series following her um, a star is born moment? Yes, I, I heard it. I have and an opinion. What's your opinion? Well, after Aquaman won, this is a major coup. Amber Heard got that role, she tested for it. She could have been the other 19 actresses or 10 or whoever else tested, didn't get it. She got the role and she got her salary uh, doubled for uh, Aquaman 1 to a million dollars. Now, Ms. Arnold wants you to believe that that million dollars would translate into, she'd get that for each episode of a series. We know what she got for a series. She got a series uh, in that period after Christmas 2018, before uh, spring of uh, 2020. She got a series. It was eight episodes, and it was $200,000 an episode. And Miss Arnold is from somewhere, in, in, in a glib way, saying she got a couple series and a million each. And I can tell you, as a, someone in the trenches, Rarely, rarely does an actor get a million dollars for a series episode. Uh, and, um, and again, in those 16 months, there were no offers for series at a million dollars an episode. In fact, her, her only series is the 200,000. And if you look at her resume, the series that Ms. Heard were in, I think the longest one ran eight episodes. Jason Momoa, if you were to believe Miss um, Arnold and somehow Jason Momoa's agent broke their confidentiality in the agreement and he had a series at a million dollars an episode, if you're to believe that, Jason Momoa has had a series with 78 episodes, with 44 episodes, with 21 episodes, with 18 episodes, with 21 episodes. He was in, again, there's not a comparableness there. We spoke a few minutes ago about the test option agreement. Um, what's the significance of the option part of that agreement? The option part of the agreement uh, gives the employer, the studio, the option. Uh, they don't have to do anything. Uh, they have an option to either employ you at a very healthy salary to play this role or not. They can recast the superhero role. You just have to think of how many actors have played Batman or Superman. They, uh, they can do what they want. And indeed, since there's no contract, they only have a choice to exercise their option or not. They might say, we're not exercising unless you reduce your compensation. Who knows what the negotiation would be but it's not a contract until the studio exercises the option and they don't have to. Um, what's the alternative to an option agreement? Well, the alternative is most agreements in Hollywood, you're hired to play the role. Uh, or once you exercise the option, then it becomes for that picture an agreement like others in Hollywood you are now hired to play that role. So most contracts are guaranteed, you're hired to play the role, 
In an option agreement, once they exercise the option, for that movie, it becomes a guaranteed contract. Are you aware that Ms. Arnold testified that Ms. Hurd was released from her Aquaman 2 contract and then subsequently um, rehired? I heard that testimony. Is that consistent with your experience in the film industry in connection with these um, multi-option contracts? No. Why not? Again, studios uh, don't do things they don't have to do. As we heard Mr. Hamada, the president of the studio, say, uh, you either exercise your option or you don't. They exercise their option. He denied releasing and then rehiring. And in my experience, in almost five decades in the business, doing this type of work, not talking about it, not consulting. I mean, I have, uh, you know, I, I heard Ms. Arnold say she'd been an expert a hundred times. That's, I'm a, I'm a transactional lawyer. I do this occasionally. Uh, basically, um, uh, you know, it's it's not a contract till they uh, option it, and and they they pick up their option, and at that point it's guaranteed contract, and then different different uh, rules apply to it. In your experience in the industry, do studios typically comment on? those types of um, actions that they're taking with respect to options? No, uh, just like Mr. Hamada said, they don't need to comment on it. They either exercise the option or they don't. In Hollywood, silence is the default. Uh, you play no card before it's time. And the, and the cards there were exercise the option or not. And I was surprised by Mr. Hamada under oath, basically saying, that there was this discussion of chemistry. That Ob objection, Your Honor, hearsay. I think it was um, it was an in court statement this morning. I believe, Your Honor. <laughs> That's fine. It's saying here say that you were. It's hearsay like yesterday. I mean, it's, it's hearsay. I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead. Thank you. I didn't hear. Go ahead, sir. Overruled. You can continue, Mr. Oh. I was surprised to hear Mr. Hamada say that they, they talked about uh, chemistry. That would normally be behind closed doors uh, because it can't help your relationship with the actor. You're either going to exercise or not. And um, that was um, uh, quite a bit of candor from someone at his level. And so, therefore, I... I uh, uh, take it at face value. I, I think he felt that he was under oath and he was telling the truth, but it okay, wouldn't objection, be. Your Honor is... I'll sustain the objection. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Marks, so are there circumstances where a studio would be more likely to say something about not using an actor again in a franchise? Yes. What are those circumstances? Once they've exercised the option, once the contract is guaranteed, the studio still has the right to pay the actor, but not play them, pay or play them. And that is a rare condition because you've hired the actor, you've got to pay them, but you say, go home, we, we'll, we're recasting. In that situation, after you've exercised the option and the contract is guaranteed, if you uh, pay off the actor, that's normally common on that becomes a bit of information because it's not normal. Is that circumstance different from uh, Ms. Hurd's contract with Warner Brothers for the Aquaman movies? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ms. Hurd's contract, again, it was just an option. Either we exercise it or we don't. And if we exercise it, she's in the film. If we don't, she's not. Until we exercise it, we have our right to recast or not make the movie, and even after we exercise it, we'd still have a right to recast and not make the movie. We just have to pay her, her salary. Do you understand that Ms. Arnold um, compares Ms. Hurd's career trajectory with that of other actors, including Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot, Zendaya, Ana de Armas, and Chris Pine? I heard that 
And what's your opinion of those actors um, as comparables for Ms. Hurd? Uh, even Ms. Hurd's agent, Jessica Kay, said that four of those actors were Objection, comparable. Your Honor, here's that. Um, I believe sa same um, response, Your Honor, that it was in testimony that was played in court earlier this week. I, I mean, he, I, that's not what she testified to. I mean, he's, he's characterizing testimony that was from days ago, and I don't even think she testified to that, Your Honor. You can, you can cross-examine over Overruled. Um, you may continue, Mr. Uh, again, uh, they are not comparable. Jason Momoa was Aquaman. Uh, Chris Pine was Captain Kirk. Gal Gadot was Wonder Woman. Zendaya has been working on Disney Channel since she was 13. Uh, she's in all the Spider-Man movies. She goes by one name. Uh, Anna de Armas, uh, you know, when she was in... Uh, a movie uh, that they call, uh, you know, her breakout, uh, it was as a, a nude poster. She's been an ensemble piece, Knives Out. These are not comparables. Now, Ms. Arnold stuck to Jason Momoa, who's the most non-comparable because of his history and his career. But she didn't give us the advantage of, of telling us what his contracts were, what he renegotiated to, what he earned. She didn't give us any of those building blocks. She just created, she set him up as a comparable and then said what Ms. Hurd should earn, but she never gave us the salary of Jason Momoa or the other comparables. And she built like this house of cards on nothing. Uh, you know, she showed us the, the, with her words the beautiful clothing that the emperor was wearing, but but we can see if you know the business. Yeah, objection, Your Honor. She, that he wasn't well beyond the scope of the question. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. Um, you were just speaking about uh, Mr. Momoa as a comparable. Are you aware that um, Ms. Arnold compares uh, Ms. Heard to uh, Mr. Momoa as an actor with equivalent franchise experience? who was able to renegotiate his salary for significant increases in bonus? Yes. What's your response to that opinion? Again, he didn't have comparable uh, franchise experience to, to Ms. Heard. He was Conan the Bar Barbarian. He played Aquaman in a movie that Amber Heard was not in. He played Aquaman, not a supporting character like Mira. It's just not comparable. Um, and you can say the words, but but I saw nothing from Miss Arnold to back it up, something to build on, which, if she was a negotiator in the trench, uh, the the studio negotiator would say, okay, so show us, you know, where's the cops? Let's talk numbers, because ultimately that's where we have to get to, not just because you say it so, we just don't believe you, You've got to show us. In your experience in the industry, what factors um, influence the negotiation of the terms of a film, film agreement with an actor? Well, I mean, first it depends on the film. If the film is a million dollar movie and everybody's deferring their salaries, that's one thing. If it's a superhero movie, that's another. But for deal makers and negotiators, the best predictor of what the deal should be is past earnings, uh, precedent, comps. Uh, you also look at the budget of the movie, what it can bear, because if uh, uh, Jason Momoa's comp is $10 million, but the budget's $10 million, obviously he has another price for that movie. but. The best predictor of future earnings is past earnings. And I didn't see any, um, uh, Ms. Arnold talked about past earnings at all, except the earnings in this rarefied superhero four picture deal where instead of incremental increases, which you normally see, uh, uh, it, it was uh, multiples increases. And then when you get on a series, the big renegotiation is was when the network has no more options. 
Until then, the actors on the series get five, 10, 15, small percentage raises. They don't get multiples. They get the multiples if it's success and the studio wants to continue making the series and they want to keep these characters. That's when the renegotiation happens. Here, even if we believe Ms. Arnold, after Aquaman 2, there was still an option waiting at a big price, uh, uh, you know, double the, the previous payday. What's the significance of the timing of the Waldman statements to the opportunities Ms. Arnold claims Ms. Heard lost? Well, the argument, as I understand it, uh, is that uh, Ms. Arnold says that Ms. Heard lost all these opportunities because of they, that, that those losses were caused by uh, uh, Adam Waldman's statements 16 months later. So I think the timing. Sure. Mr. Marks, what's your overall assessment of Ms. Arnold's opinions in this case? Uh, my overall assessment of her opinions is that they're not worth the paper they're not written on. She knows something about our business, but not about negotiating deals. She may have uh, gotten someone at the, more, at the Endeavor office to uh, breach confidentiality, but she Objection. never laid out the, the building Objection. blocks. Objection. Excuse, Objection. Objection. You have to stop talking, Mr. Marks. Thank you. Um, beyond the scope. Yeah, Mr. Marks, can you okay. just limit your, um, limit your testimony to your opinion about um, okay. Ms. Arnold's opinions, please? My opinion as someone who's made deals uh, as a deal maker for almost 50 years is that uh, she calls herself an expert, but she's not. She uh, doesn't have the background. She doesn't have the day-to-day -day, uh, knowledge. And her testimony that I heard did not back up her bottom line. If you want to get those figures, you have to show why uh, they're deserved. And again, uh, it, she was constructing a Jenga without the bottom uh, pieces. It, it does not hold up under scrutiny by someone who makes deals. No further questions. All right, cross-examination. Good morning, Mr. Marks. Good morning. <clears throat> so you agree that studios use comps to negotiate deals, correct, with actors? Sometimes they do. Okay. And you have an issue with the comps that um, Ms. Arnold used, correct, as you testified to? I have an issue with the comps that she says she used that she didn't disclose. The comps being the actors that you just talked about. She did disclose, I mean, she disclosed the actors. She disclosed the actors and budget figures from their movies. She never disclosed their salaries and salary history as comps. Did, you're not offering a different set of comparators that should be used, correct? I'm saying if you are going to... I'm not, that's not my question. Are you offering a different set of comparators than what Ms. Arnold used? I, I'm, I'm not uh, here offering uh, comparators. I'm saying what she offered not or not comp comparators. That, that, was my, that was my question. You're not offering comparators, correct? No. I would say that Ms. Hurd's comparisons sir, sir, are where you are. That was my question. Can, 
motion to strike after the oh, no. all right we'll strike after that just answer the questions mr marks thank you now you're a deal you're a deal maker correct yes what actors have you negotiated for in superhero movies uh well recently uh i've acted i've negotiated for um uh chris pratt in a, a superhero series for amazon i've negotiated uh, a deal for uh Michael Douglas, not in a superhero movie, but a, a historical movie. I've negotiated recently uh, a deal for Paul Rudd and Will Ferrell on, a, on an Apple series. Uh, Billy Crudup on an Apple series. Have Those are the recent talent deals. What actors have you negotiated for a superhero movie? movie? Um, as I sit here now, I can't remember a superhero movie uh, that I've uh, uh, negotiated. Uh, I've certainly negotiated over my career um, uh, franchise movies uh, and fantasy movies. Uh, uh, Your Honor, uh, so it's no, you haven't negotiated with any for any actors for superhero movies, correct? So you would define like um, uh, I don't know, Jungle Book uh, isn't a superhero movie. It's more of a fantasy. Okay. So, so no, correct your answer. Okay. No. All right. So as I sit here, I can't think of a, of a, of a uh, Marvel-type superhero movie that I've uh, negotiated, although I know there's one or two in yeah. there. Now, you testified and you agree that Mr. Momoa negotiated his multi-picture contract for, for Aquaman 2, correct? I heard uh, Mr. Hamada say there was a renegotiation, uh, but no facts were uh, uh, pro-offered, such as he didn't have an option, uh, his options were out, what he was earning and what he renegotiated to, and he is Aquaman man. So yes, I did hear there was a renegotiation. And you understand that his salary went from three to four million to fifteen million dollars? If you tell me that, I haven't seen his contract and I haven't heard any testimony under oath uh, that that's where the leap was. Now, Ms. Hurd's contract... Did, he get, more, did Hurd, they get more options for Ms. when Ms. they Hurd, made that leap? Did they get more options? Ms. Hurd's contract was a talent option contract, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you agree that for the... Aqua, if there's an Aquaman 3, Ms. Hurd would have an option to receive $4 million, correct, for the movie? Well, actually, you would language it. Warner Brothers would have the option to engage her. And if they engaged her, she would receive $4 million, correct? Yeah. She doesn't have the option to refuse. They have the option to engage her. And she would receive $4 million, correct? Yes, $4 million. Would you agree that the money Amber was making on Aquaman 2 or 3 would be her market rate for future studio movies? I would think it would be her rate for su uh, future studio superhero movies, uh, but not necessarily studio movies that aren't superheroes. That could be standalone. That could be other type of studio movies. But for super, but for studio superhero movies, it would be four million dollars, correct? If I was uh, uh, Miss Hurd's agent, that's where I would start, okay. assuming everything was equal the budget of the superhero movie, that she was uh, in the ensemble. There's a lot of uh, ifs to look at, but all things being you, equal. You agree that Aquaman was a breakthrough role for Miss Hurd, wasn't it? Uh, it's, it's the first movie of that ilk that she makes, but she is not Aquaman. She is Mira. But it was a breakthrough movie for Miss Hurd, correct? For, for her, it's a breakthrough movie to be in that film and in the ensemble. Absolutely. And she was the female star of that, of that movie, correct? I believe so. You would agree that for all of the actors Ms. Arnold listed as comparables, their career trajectory went up after their breakthrough, correct? She didn't give us the raw materials to look at, but I'll take your word that all those unrelated actors in unrelated films, except for Jason Momoa, they went up. 
in your experience, as did Miss Arnold when in, she went from one to two. In your experience, can you identify an actor or an actress who's not been able to get a new studio movie after a breakthrough performance in a superhero movie? Uh, as I sit here now, I haven't been asked to to opine on that, but there are lots of supporting characters in movies that don't appear in the next movie. The, but the but a female star in a breakthrough movie in a superhero movie, can you identify any actress who's not gotten another studio movie after that? Uh, well, after Miss uh, Hurd's breakthrough in 2018, she did get Aquaman 2. Aquaman and, 2 was already, she okay. already had the option for Aquaman 2. All right, correct. so she did, uh, Miss Hurd did not get any movies after uh, 2018, long before the Adam Waldman statement. Other than Miss Heard, can you identify any actor or actress who's not gotten another studio movie after their breakthrough in a superhero movie? As I sit here now, I haven't been asked to research that, and I and I can't. That okay. would be a normal uh, uh, thing. And you're you're not providing an alternative number for Miss Heard's damages, correct, for the jury. Correct. I'm not uh, providing an alternate number. I think, uh, you know, she's been more than uh, adequately paid. I, I'd move to strike after no, I've not been provided another number. That's all. I mean, my question was you're not providing another number. I think it's in fairness and the full answer of the question, Your Honor. It was a, it was a yes or no question. He said his answer was no. I'm not going to strike it. Okay. All right. No further questions. All right. Redirect. Um, Mr. Marks, uh, in response to some questions from Mr. Ladehack, you were um, discussing some franchise and fantasy uh, movie agreements that you've negotiated with uh, actors. Could you just describe some of those for us? I, you know, I've had such a long career that I mainly forget what I've done, but. I negotiated all the contracts for uh, uh, Pinocchio, if you will, that was produced. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, is coming to America the, the original? Is is that a fantasy movie? The Golden Child is that a fantasy movie? Uh, uh, yeah, and and by the way, I may have negotiated contracts uh, and ultimately the film wasn't made uh, but as I sit here now uh, those are the only ones that come to pass if I was looking at my my resume or uh, going through my files I might think of others but there isn't a deal that I haven't made and I think you also um, testified in response to Mr. Nadelhaft's questions that you um, have negotiated some deals for um, Chris Pratt and Paul Rudd. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, these are for a streaming series. Do you happen to know if both of those actors have played Marvel superheroes? I, I believe uh, uh, they, they have, but don't quote me because, you know, that's not my genre. Okay. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Marks. You can, uh, you're free to stay in the courtroom or, or you can leave, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Plaintiff calls Michael Spindler. Michael Spindler. You've testified previously, correct, Mr. Spindler? All right. Just a reminder that you're still under oath, okay, sir? Yes. All right, thank you. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Spindler. Good morning. Uh, can you remind the jury? who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm Michael Spindler. I'm a forensic accountant. I'm a CPA, a certified fraud examiner, amongst some other certifications. I'm uh, with uh, B. Riley Advisory Services, a national firm that does forensic accounting, bankruptcy and restructuring work, and business uh, valuations and appraisals. I've got over 40 years of experience. Are you familiar with the testimony rendered by Ms. Arnold in this matter? Yes, I am. Do you understand that Ms. Arnold testified that Ms. Hurd has suffered economic damages resulting from three statements made by Mr. Walden? Yes, I do. 
Do you have an opinion of that claim? I do. Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? All right. Thanks, Mr. Spindler. Now, you indicated that you would listen to Ms. Arnold, and she testified on behalf of uh, Ms. Hurd relative to economic damages. Have you formed an opinion as to the testimony and opinion rendered by Ms. Ar by Ms. Arnold? Yes, I have. And what's that opinion? It is not adequately supported, and it is unreasonable. There were multiple elements to that analysis, uh, both damages that related to her film career and to endorsements. Have you analyzed both those issues? Yes, I have. What is your opinion of the claims that have been asserted relative to the film career and endorsements? OK, well, first of all, with respect to her damages, calculation. There was no calculation, per se. Um, she initially looked at these comparable actors and seemed to use that as a basis for numbers. She didn't provide the underlying calculation. She didn't provide underlying support. Uh, and then it appeared as though uh, in her testimony, she backed away a little bit from that, but she still suffers from the issues of not providing detailed calculations or support for where those numbers come from. And she still, to some extent, appears to be using some kind of comparable analysis. All right. What is the type of analysis that you think is appropriate here? Well, I think, and as you heard from the last witness, I think that something that is anchored in facts, uh, taking a look at historical compensation as a basis for anticipating future compensation. Had you looked at Ms. Hurd's prior compensation? Yes, I have. I've looked at uh, tax returns that were provided for the period of 2013 through 2019. Why do you want to use historical earnings? Well, once again, you want an analysis is anchored in fact. Uh, I don't believe that Ms. Arnold has done that in her analysis. So here we've got some actual data. We've got some historical compensation. And as the last witness mentioned, that often provides somewhat of a basis for future anticipated earnings. In addition, uh, I believe that Ms. Arnold herself said that she had hoped to be able to look at a renegotiated salary for Aquaman 2 and then use that as a basis for future compensation, that being uh, the new kind of base, if you will. Oh. Were there any years in particular that you focused on in your analysis as to uh, Ms. Arnold's testimony? Uh, in terms of uh, the, the historical compensation? Yes. Well, for 2013 through 2019 in total, her compensation was around $10 million. 
for all those years combined. Uh, in 2019, the last of those years, her compensation was uh, somewhere between about $2.6 million and $3 million. Now, that's a good year. That's known as a clean year. What do you uh, mean by a clean year? Well, you know, for example, 2019, you had Aquaman was released in December of 2018, and that was a successful film. So in 2019, you've got the benefit of that kind of success, uh, and you also don't have the, any potential impact from the alleged defamatory Waldman statements that uh, occurred in April of 2020. So 2019 is clean of all that. What did you understand Ms. Arnold's methodology to be? Her methodology initially appeared to be based on these comparable actors that she had identified and theoretically the compensation that they earned, although she doesn't identify what that compensation is or provide any support for it or any calculations. What is your opinion of that methodology from an accounting perspective? Uh, that methodology was unsound. It's just unsupported. Uh, there are no numbers. There's no data that she provided as support for that. What methodology did you understand Ms. Arnold to adopt at trial? Okay, well, it looked like somewhat of a mix and match approach. She used different approaches, I believe, for different elements of the damages, although it's, it's still a little bit unclear to me, a little bit vague. But uh, there are four basic components that she was looking at, uh, and uh, we can go through those in, in any order you wish. All right. With respect to the television series, series portion of her analysis, what do you understand uh, that methodology to be? Okay. Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? All right.
uh, earnings from television shows. What was, did you analyze what historical earning um, Ms. Hurd had during the period that you were concerned with relative to television shows? Well, yes, during 2019, she entered into a contract in July of 2019 to uh, appear in a television series at $200,000 per episode. All right. What about endorsement deals? Did you look at what she had made on endorsement deals during that period? Uh, she did have a contract with L'Oreal uh, at $1,625,000. All right. With respect to her movie roles, what were her, her historical earnings during that period? Well, uh, certainly for the most recent years, you had the, um, the Warner Brothers deal, which was a four-picture deal. The first film was $450,000. Then the first Aquaman was $1 million fee, base fee. Then $2 million for Aquaman 2. And uh, presuming that there was an Aquaman 3, that would have been $4 million. OK. Um, why do you look at historical earnings as part of your analysis? Because you want your analysis to be anchored in facts. Uh, you wanted to have a sound methodology, and you want to come up with a reasonable result. So if you take a look at, for example, um, the analysis that Ms. Arnold did, it didn't okay, appear no, to be... Let, let's, let's just look at the analysis that yeah. you're doing. Um, so um, what you said, I think, is you wanted them anchored in facts. Why? because that provides a sound basis for coming up with something with reasonable certainty. Uh, there's AICPA, or American Institute of Certified Public Accountant guidance with respect to reasonable certainty. And those are the basic elements of it. Thank you. No further questions. All right, cross-examination. Hello again, Mr. Spindler. Good morning. I'm going to ask you a few questions that may refer to the statements in Amber's counterclaim against Mr. Depp. Um, when I refer to those statements, I'm going to refer to them as the Depp-Waldman statements. Do you agree that we can both be on the same page what I'm referring to when I say that? Uh, that's fine. You can I'm use sorry. your terminology. I'm sorry. There's objections, sir. Hold on. Can we approach? Okay. So, Mr. Spindler, when I refer to the Depp Waldman statements, you understand me to be referring to the statements in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim against Mr. Depp, correct? I'll understand that, yes. Now, you're, you're here to provide a, a rebuttal opinion to Ms. Arnold's, part of Ms. Arnold's testimony, correct? Correct. You're not providing an opinion on whether Ms. Hurd suffered defamation by Mr. Depp, correct? That is true. You're not offering an opinion as to what any of the underlying facts relating to whether Mr. Depp abused Amber, correct? That's correct. You're not offering an opinion as to the magnitude of damages that you believe Ms. Hurd may be entitled to if she proves defamation by Mr. Depp. You're just reviewing what Ms. Arnold has said, correct? That's correct. And you said that you want your analysis to be accurate in, in facts, right? Anchored in facts. Anchored in facts. 
you'd agree that what an actor earns in one period isn't necessarily reflective of what he or she may earn in future periods, correct? Correct. And it, that's because there can be some variability. In roles, yes. An increase in the number of roles may lead to greater income, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was, I was speaking, I didn't hear. One of the reasons that what you earn in one period may not be reflected of reflective of what an actress may earn in future periods is because an increase in the number of roles may lead to greater income, correct? The number of roles or the particular project itself, yes. Sure, getting better roles may lead to greater income, correct? Correct. And the same is true for an endorsement. As, as an actress's profile grows, the amount of money that she may be able to earn from endorsements grows as well, correct? It can. So it depends. what Ms. Hurd earned from say 2013 to 2019 that you testified to isn't necessarily reflective of what she might earn over the next five years, correct? Not necessarily. It is a good indicator, though. And you'd agree that from 2013 to 2019, in terms of earnings and star power, that Ms. Hurd's career trajectory was on the upswing, correct? There was a, a, a slight increase during that period of time in her earnings from 2013 through 2019. And you'd agree that that was as a result of getting more lucrative roles, right? Yes. Now, you're not a causation expert, right? You're just a damages expert? That's correct. So you're not testifying as to whether the Depp Waldman statements caused her to lose any roles, correct? That's correct. And you're not offering any opinion as to whether the Depp Waldman statements kept her from being considered for roles that she otherwise would have been considered, considered for, correct? That's correct. I'm not testifying on causation issues. And you can't speak to what opportunities may never have materialized for Amber as a result of the Depp Waldman statements, correct? Uh, yeah, I've not done those calculations. And you don't have an opinion about whether or not Ms. Hurd could have renegotiated a contract for Aquaman 2, correct? That was not part of my work. And you don't have an opinion on the impact that additional exposure or press coverage or magazine covers or interviews would have had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Correct. I'm just looking at Ms. Arnold's calculations. You've never served as an expert witness before to calculate damages based on lost roles by an actress resulting from defamation against that person, correct? I've been involved in defamation cases, but I've not done uh, the calculations as an expert witness and testified there too. And there's never been an instance in which you have served as an expert witness in a case to calculate damages based on alleged defamation against an actress, correct? Correct. And you're not offering any expert opinion on what impact the alleged defamation by Mr. Depp has had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, one more time? You're not offering any expert opinion on what impact the Depp Waldman statements by Mr. Depp has had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Other than taking a look at Ms. Uh, Arnold's uh, calculations. And you're not offering any expert opinion about what impact, if any, social media coverage of this case or of Ms. Hurd may have had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? You're correct. That's other experts. Can we approach No further right? questions. Thank you. All right. You. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Finley. You can thank have you. a seat in the courtroom or thank you're you free to go. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Plaintiff calls Doug Banya, Your Honor. Okay. Can you spell the last name for me? B-A-N-I-A. Thank you. So you can. <coughs> so just a reminder that you're still under oath, okay, sir? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Banya. Good afternoon. 
Can you briefly reintroduce yourself to the jury, please? Uh, yes. Hi, Doug Bonia. Um, I am from Nevium Intellectual Property Consultants based in San Diego. I um, value intellectual property. I provide litigation support uh, in infringement and defamation cases, as I'm doing today. Uh, and I use um, internet and social media analytics in both of those services. Since you last testified in this case, the jury has heard testimony from Ronald Schnell and Catherine Arnold. Are you familiar with their testimony? Yes. Were you asked to analyze their testimony and provide opinions in response? Yes, I was. Have you formed opinions in response to the testimony of Mr. Schnell and Ms. Arnold? I have. Generally, what are those opinions? Uh, generally, um, you know, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence of uh, a correlation between the Waldman statements and the hashtags and the spikes of those hashtags on Twitter. Uh, second, based on my internet and social media analytics uh, investigation, uh, I've concluded that the uh, alleged comparable actors that uh, Ms. Arnold uh, came up with are not comparable with Ms. Heard. And then thirdly, um, Mr. Schnell uh, and Ms. Arnold uh, both failed to provide any evidence of, of a, a causation as it relates to the Waldman statements uh, causing any economic harm to Ms. Heard. Let's, um, let's dig into those opinions a little bit. Um, you're familiar with the testimony of Mr. Schnell that there are more than 2.7 million alleged negative tweets related to Ms. Heard between January 2018 and June 2021? Yes. And what's your understanding of how Mr. Schnell identified those particular 2.7 million tweets? Yeah, so essentially Mr. Schnell um, chose hashtags that he felt were negative uh, towards Ms. Heard. Uh, those hashtags uh, range from uh, justice for Johnny Depp, um, Amber Heard is an abuser, Amber Turd, and the hash uh, tag, we just don't like you, Amber. So then he used those hashtags and he searched through, using the Twitter API, uh, searched through various tweets and then came up with any uh, uh, tweets that were using those hashtags. Did you conduct an analysis of those tweets? Yes, I was given that exact uh, uh, the data that Mr. Schnell used on a hard drive. So yes, I, I, I dug into that data as well. And what was the purpose of your analysis? So what I'm trying to do and what's at issue of the case today, uh, today at this point is, you know, were these tweets, did they contain the Waldman statements? That, that's what we're, where we're at right now, are the Wal Waldman statements. So I wanted to analyze those tweets to determine uh, which ones and if any uh, contain the Waldman statements. And what's your understanding of what the Waldman statements are? So my understanding is there the three there's three Waldman statements that were published uh, in the Daily Mail. Uh, the Daily Mail is a, a, a UK tabloid, and um, Mr. Um, Arnold um, was quoted in the, in three of those articles. Um, and those dates were on April 8th, 2020, uh, April 27th, 2020, and on June 24th, 2020. And my understanding that those quotes, um, those quotes, I, 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 sorry, I, forget, I think I said the wrong name, but those quotes uh, are the only uh, remaining uh, in this case. Did you analyze the timing of the tweets that we were talking about as compared to the timing of the Waldman statements? And that's exactly what I did. So I wanted to look at the Walden statements, look at the dates uh, that they happened, and then analyze those as it compared to the Twitter data that I had. Have you prepared a demonstrative that reflects that aspect of your analysis? Yes. Um, your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Did you speak to counsel?
so 1293 will just be marked for identification as demonstrative and can be published to the jury. Mr. Vanya, can you explain to the jury what this demonstrative shows? Yes. Um, so this shows um, the total hashtags and tweets uh, that Mr. Schnell was analyzing. Uh, this is the summary data. It, uh, there are tweets that are running from January 2018 uh, to June of 2021. And again, uh, these are related to the four, four hashtags that I discussed. Um, whenever I get an assignment such as this, when I'm dealing with a, a defamatory statement that's allegedly gone viral online, uh, where there's economic damages involved and there's a lot of data involved, I like to take the data and I like to do a, a 30,000 foot view of the data to see what I'm looking at, different about the data. Uh, and, and the first thing that I noticed is 35% of the tweets were prior to the Waldman statements. So again, remember my assignment is to determine if the Waldman statements are part of the, the, the tweets uh, that Mr. Schnell analyzed. So obviously, if uh, these tweets were prior to the Waldman statements, in no way could they have anything to do with the Waldman statements. So th that was the first uh, issue um, that I noticed. Then I noticed uh, what I like to call kind of the alleged defamatory time frame. And as I discussed, that's when the um, uh, Waldman statements were published. That's the date down here. You know, the first one was in the beginning of April, and, and the last one, which is the third one, was at the end of, of June. But what I found interesting is only 2% of all of the tweets happened during this Waldman statement period. So really, these are just observations. And for me, there were red flags that I made note of. And then I just continued with my analysis. Um, what other work have you performed in connection with forming your opinions about the purportedly negative tweets? Yeah, so now I realize that 35% are irrelevant and 2% you know, only happened during this, this important period. I just continued to dig into the 2.79 million um, uh, tweets that Mr. Schnell provided. And Tom, can we take that one down? And Mr. Banya, have you prepared another demonstrative that um, depicts that analysis that you were just described? Yes. Your Honor, may I? Okay, first? yes. All right. Okay, we'll just see if he has an objection. No, just get, I'll give you time to look at it, sir. All right, plaintiffs. If you could turn on the microphone, I'm sorry. No objection as a demonstrative. Okay. All right, plaintiffs exhibit 1294 will be marked for identification as a demonstrative and will be published to the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Banya, can you explain um, what this demonstrative shows? Yes, this is showing um, the various spikes um, as it relates to the hashtags that Mr. Chanel uh, testified about. This is actually an exhibit or a demonstrative that he used in his testimony. Uh, what this is showing uh, are the large, largest spikes related to the hashtag justice for Johnny Depp. Uh, I don't know if you remember his testimony or, or any of his demonstratives. The other three hashtags did spike at the same time, but a very small spike. So what I'm showing you here are, are, are the six top spikes in Mr. Schnell's analysis. And what's important here again is the very first spike and the largest spike again uh, happened before the Waldman statements. So what I'm trying to figure out is what tweets ha were related to the Waldman statements. So this number one spike, which is the biggest spike, was prior to the Waldman statements. So it's irrelevant to the case. And then the second thing I noticed that was interesting here is here are the dates in gray right here. 
Um, this is the time in which the Waldman statements happened. And you're going to notice, as we discussed before, only 2% of the tweets happened during that time. But I found it very interesting for such a viral event that has potentially caused such economic harm, there's no spikes in this area. And actually, you're going to see that Mr. Waldman, you know, uh, his uh, uh, statement came out here in the, in the first April 2020 article. Then the second one came out here. And then the third one came out in June. There's actually a downward use of the spike, uh, downward use of the hashtags. So I'm not seeing any correlation uh, as it relates to uh, the Waldman statements and, and any spikes here as it relates to the hashtags Mr. Chanel chose. Did you analyze each of the spikes that are depicted here? Yeah, so what I did is um, I looked at the six different spikes, and you're going to notice that each spike represents uh, a month. So uh, the second spike, uh, you know, is July of 2020, and so on to the sixth spike going to April 2021. And what I did is, I don't know if you remember in my last testimony when I went into Google search, and I'm able to go into Google search, I went in and I typed in Amber Heard, and then after you hit search, you can use the tool and you can go back in time. And I chose each six of these dates to go back in time to see what, what was the media talking about back then. You know, what, what was the, the general public being fed as it relates to Amber Heard back during those spikes. And what I found is none of them, but well, I actually analyzed the top three search results because they represent 50 to 70% of what people click on. And that, well, I realized that none of them had anything to do with the Waldman statements. Are you aware of Mr. Schnell's testimony that the tweets using the four hashtags he looked at were mathematically correlated? Yes. What does that mean? So what Mr. Schnell is saying, uh, which is irrelevant to this case, is the four hashtags that he randomly chose, they, they tend to go up and down together. And that's why he had these spikes here. So the correlation there is how those four hashtags work or dance together going up and down. But first of all, the hashtags have nothing to do with the Waldman statements. And the fact that there's a correlation with, with the hashtags is irrelevant to this case because we're dealing with the Waldman statements, which none of that correlation analysis he did had to do with. How do you know that the correlation doesn't have anything to do with the Waldman statements? Um, can I clear this at all? No. Oh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I know because that, that would happen right here. You know, if, if, if when Mr. Waldman, one of his quotes was published, you would see a big spike right here. And then you would see maybe a little noise down here. And then the third time you might see a big, second time a big spike, and the third time a big spike. That's not here. So that's telling me there's no correlation between the Waldman statements and, and this hashtag use. And then I've actually provided evidence that there's no correlation because I analyze each of these spikes and none of them had to do with the Waldman statements. Is mathematical correlation the same as causation? No. Why not? I mean, uh, correlation is simply a relationship between uh, two or more variables or two or more things. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the correlation question is, did when, when, when the um, Waldman statements were published, at the same time, did you see a correlation with spikes in these hashtags? And again, you... Can we clear this? You, you see none of that right here. It's actually a downward trend. There's no spikes. There's no correlation. So, you know, again, Mr. Schnell proved, provided no evidence of any correlation. What correlation opinion did he provide during his testimony? Well, he provided the correlation that the four hashtags, you know, spike together. But again, those a, the hashtags have nothing to do with the Waldman statements, and the fact that they're correlating or moving together is irrelevant to the case because the case is about the Waldman statements. So what is causation then? 
So causation is where one thing causes a change in the other. So as it relates to this case, did the Waldman statements cause Ms. Heard to have economic harm? In other words, did the Waldman statements cause Ms. Heard not to make as much money in her career? And again, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence of this. Uh, Ms. Arnold provided no evidence of this. And as a matter of fact, during Ms. Arnold's testimony yesterday, she didn't even know what causation was. You know, she was asked, do you know the difference between causation and correlation? And she said that she's not a semantics expert. We're, we're not talking about the words. You know, when it comes to damages, you have to prove causation prior to calculating damages. You know, so there is no causation that's proven here. Uh, therefore, a damages uh, uh, analysis is not appropriate. Did you hear Mr. Schnell testify that he agreed with your opinion in this case? Yes. And what's your understanding of the opinion that he agreed with? Well, he agreed that he failed to link the spikes in the uh, hashtags on Twitter to the Waldman statements. Did he try to do that? He, well, he tried to do that. But Did again, well, again, his analysis was looking at the word Waldman and looking at the word Waldminian and then <laughs> trying to say that 25% of the tweets included those two terms. But first of all, Waldman isn't the issue here. It's the Waldman statements. And Waldminian, I don't even know what that is, but it's not relevant to this case. We can, I think, take that one down, please, Tom. Mr. Banya, what other work have you done in connection with forming your opinions about Mr. Schnell's testimony? Again, the assignment was to determine if the Waldman statements were part of the, the tweet, so I continued to dig in uh, you know, to the data. Uh, I believe the next step is now that I've excluded you know, the 35% that was before the Waldman statements because they were irrelevant, I wanted to really analyze from the April 2020 forward to see if any of those tweets uh, you know, were contained the Waldman statements. Did you prepare a demonstrative that reflects that analysis that you did? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach again? All right. Yes, ma'am. Any objection, sir? No objection as a demonstrative. All right. We'll mark it for identification as plaintiff's 1295 as demonstrative and published to the jury. So, Mr. Banya, did you consider um, the content of the statements made by Waldman as part of the work that you did? Yes. Yeah, so here I reviewed the Waldman statements again. And what I wanted to do uh, is I wanted to determine what, uh, if any, tweets included the Waldman statements. Uh, so what I went, uh, I went back to the Waldman statements and I, I came up with you know, you know, key terms and key themes uh, for, for those Waldman statements, which are listed here. Uh, uh, you know, the Waldman statements were about abuse hoax, sexual violence hoax, and fake sexual violence. So what I did is I, we're now dealing with a 1.2 million tweets because you know, we're starting in April 2020 because that's when the Waldman state, uh, statements uh, started. And what I did is I searched the 1.2 million um, tweets, you know, for these uh, three uh, phrases, and I determined that there were 751 tweets that included those key terms, uh, which is 0.06% of the 1.2 million. And then as I was sifting and sorting and analyzing this data, I, I realized that a lot of these tweets had the exact same language. You know, it was interesting to see it was the exact, exact same tweet because I'm analyzing the language to see if it matches uh, one of these three. I realized that a lot of these tweets were retweet, retweets, likes, uh, or shares. So therefore, I eliminated uh, any of those and it came down uh, with 95 unique tweets. And then what I did from there is I analyzed those to determine if any of these terms were in there. And I, I identified five tweets 
that were related to the Waldman statements. Do any of the hashtags Mr. Schnell analyzed include the words from the Waldman statements? No, no, they don't. And, uh, you know, because I am rebutting um, Ms. Arnold, you know, her testimony yesterday, she was saying that the Waldman statements caused these hashtags. Then throughout her, her testimony, she walked that back and admitted, no, none of these tweets have anything to do with the Waldman statements. They don't include the Waldman statements. You know, these hashtags are only hashtags that Schnell, in his opinion, felt that they were negative towards Ms. Hurd. Based on your expertise, what are your overall opinions about Mr. Schnell's testimony and the Twitter hashtag data? You know, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence that any of the tweets uh, were related uh, to the Waldman statements. Um, Mr. Schnell, there's no correlation there. Uh, he also provided no evidence that there's any causation that, you know, the, the Waldman statements call, caused any economic harm towards Ms. Hurd. Your Honor, I'm about to switch to a different topic. I don't know if you want to break now or push. All right, it's going to be a, a little while, I assume? A, a little bit more, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead and break for lunch, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Do not discuss the case and do not do the outside research, okay? All right, we'll come back at 140 then. Is that right? All right, thank you. All right.
Thank you, sir. All right, are we ready for the jury? Oh, okay, sure. You may be seated. All right. Do you need to approach for a moment? Okay, sure. Your next question, Mr. Vanya. Um, before lunch, we were talking about your opinions in response to the testimony of Mr. Schnell. Did you also um, analyze the testimony of Ms. Arnold in this case? Yes, I did. And are you aware of her opinion that Ms. Hurd's career would have followed the same trajectory as that of Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot, Zendaya, Ana de Armas, and Chris Pine, if not for the Waldman statements? Yes. What's your understanding of Ms. Arnold's basis? Um, for her opinion that Ms. Hurd's career should have been similar to that of those identified actors? Um, Ms. Arnold uh, stated that when producers or her industry is looking to uh, hire uh, talent and actors that it's important to 
but best understand the, the public's perception of um, the actors that they're considering uh, and that it's important to you know, look into social media uh, to see what, what is happening with uh, the actors they're considering for either a movie or even a, uh, an endorsement opportunity with companies. Um, so that, that was her approach. And is that the process she followed in providing her analysis of those purportedly comparable actors? No. She, although she stated that, she went in and uh, brought in these comparable, uh, alleged comparable actors and um, without really the reasoning behind that. Did you conduct an analysis based on your expertise in social media and internet analytics of Ms. Heard compared to the actors to whom Ms. Arnold um, compares her? I did. And what did you find? Well, since uh, Ms. Arnold stated that the proper approach is looking at the public perspective, looking into social media, uh, and, and she did not do that, I felt that was the best approach to do this based on her, her words. So yes, I did go into uh, you know, best understanding the public perspective of um, Ms. Heard and the alleged comparable actors using Q scores. And then I also went and did some analysis on online and on social media as well. Can you briefly remind the jury what Q scores are? Yeah, again, Q scores uh, measure uh, how well a celebrity, it could be a, a cartoon character, it could be a sports person, how well they're known, how well they're liked, and how much they're disliked. And it's, it's an industry standard tool that's used. Uh, it's not just focused on the movies that they're in, but it's uh, focused on them as actors, uh, but also uh, what's happening in their personal lives uh, come to play as well. Uh, so that's how Q scores are typically used. Did you prepare a demonstrative that reflects the Q score analysis you completed? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach again? All right, thank you. No objection to the demonstrative. All right, we'll identify plaintiffs 1296 um, for identification and publish to the jury. Mr. Banya, what, what point in time do these Q scores represent that are reflected on your demonstrative? So this, uh, these are the winter 2019 Q scores um, that are reflected here. And what was important for me is I, I wanted to find Q scores uh, that represented Miss Heard after Aquaman. And you know, remember, Aquaman is December of 2018. These Q scores were gathered in February of 19, but before the Waldman statements. And what did you find based on the Q scores that you looked at? So, as you see here on the left, uh, are positive Q scores, and it, you know, the higher the number, the better. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, Ms. Godot uh, has the highest Q score out of the, out of the group of uh, actors here uh, at a 28. Uh, but you're going to notice Ms. Hurd uh, has the lowest positive Q score. Uh, she has a 9. Uh, so I find that um, very interesting that uh, she doesn't appear to fit in as a comparable with these alleged comparable actors. Um, I think what's also interesting is the average Q score for all actors being scored at that time, which include uh, all the alleged comparable actors here, score uh, at an average of 17. And you can see, again, she is nine well below that. And then on the right side, you're going to see the negative Q scores. So this is uh, how much people dislike you. Um, you know, so the lower the score is better. Uh, you can see Mr. Momoa is over here with the lowest at an 8. But you can see Ms. Hurd is over here at a 28, which is, was quite a difference. Uh, you know, a 20-point difference from Mr. Momoa, uh, and also a 10-point difference, uh, you know, from the average of all actors. So she is very, very much little, uh, her positive score is very low, and her negative score is, is very high, uh, which tells me that she does not fit in as a comparable as it relates to these alleged comparable actors. 
Um, what opinions did you form based on that Q score analysis? Uh, my opinions as it relates to these Q scores is, um, you know, uh, Miss Arnold used uh, these uh, actors as allegedly comparable actors. Um, but really, listening to her testimony yesterday, it appears that she's abandoned this approach. I don't think she's using these comparable actors or these alleged comparable actors anymore. She's more relying on her um, experience, and I agree with that. Did Ms. Arnold offer a criticism of your use of the Q scores here? She did, yes. And what's your understanding of what that criticism is? Well, what I believe she was saying is that I should have ran Q scores for these allegedly comparable actors after each of their breakout films, which um, I disagree. First of all, Q scores doesn't work like that. Q scores are available twice a year, so it's not that I could pick a month or a different month for each of, of, of the Q score um, actors. Um, so I feel that, you know, what was important for me, and this doesn't always happen when, when I'm using Q-scores, you can get this per perfect moment in time, as Ms. Hurd said, I'm sorry, but as Ms. Arnold said, that, you know, Aquaman was Ms. Hurd's breakout moment. You know, so these scores reflect that, that breakout moment, uh, and, and, and they're terrible Q-scores. How would your analysis change if you had used um, Ms. Arnold's logic with respect to the, to the timing of the Q scores that you looked at? I mean, if you really think about what uh, Ms. Arnold was saying, is she's saying that she thinks Q scores are the highest for each actor right after their breakout moment. So I would think, if anything, uh, these Q scores could have been a bit lower. Uh, because it's not right after their breakout moment. But what again, what's important for me is the fact that these scores reflect, you know, who Amber Heard was at the time before the Waldman statements, but after the Aquaman release. Um, we can take that one down, Tom. Thank you. What other work have you done um, in connection with forming your opinions in this case? Um, again, taking the advice from Ms. Arnold, it's important. Uh, she says the industry looks into social media, uh, what their followings are like, uh, you know, with the numbers as it relates to their followers. Um, you know, again, what is the public perception of them? So I, I analyzed uh, their social media accounts, um, but prior to the, the Waldman statement. So, and how, how did you do that? Yeah, so what I did, I don't know if you're all familiar with the archive.org. Uh, they have a tool called the Wayback Machine. What archive.org does is it, it archives the internet. So you can go back in time to see what websites and web pages used to look like uh, in the past. Uh, not all the time can you actually get a celebrity's social media accounts to have been archived, but uh, we were fortunate that each of the alleged comparable actors' social media accounts were in um, archive.org. So I was able to go back in time prior to the Waldman statements to see what, what the following activity was for each of the alleged comparable actors. Mr. Banya, did you prepare a demonstrative um, that def reflects your social media analysis? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes, ma'am. No objection to the demonstrative. All right, we'll mark it for identification purposes. Plaintiffs 1297 and publish. Mr. Banya, could you tell the jury what you found when you looked at the social media? Yeah, so what I found again, this is prior to the Waldman statements. You know, first thing you're going to notice here is not all actors use social media. You're going to see Mr. Pine uh, doesn't have Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram and Momo and Darmus don't use Facebook or Twitter. Uh, but what's important to look at is um, you have misheard prior to the Waldman statements with 3.8 um, Instagram followers and 142,500 uh, Twitter followers. And then you, you, you move down to uh, Gal Gadot uh, with 37 million Instagram followers compared to 3.8 million. Uh, and you know, uh, two million, two point three million uh, Twitter followers compared to Ms. Hurd's one hundred and forty-two thousand 
and you can then even go down to Zendaya with 65 million, 0.9, and 17.2 million uh, Twitter followers. What this is telling me is really, you know, more people are interested in Ms. Godot, in Zendaya, and even uh, Mr. Momoa uh, than Ms. Heard on social media. It, it just tells me a lot of people are interested in these uh, actors as opposed to Ms. Heard, more of a following. Q scores, well-liked, less disliked. So it kind of fits into the analysis of determining whether or not these alleged comparable actors are actually comparable. Based on your expertise, what are your overall opinions about uh, Ms. Arnold's analysis of the so-called comparable actors? Yes, again, you know, it appears that she's abandoned this approach, but, and I agree with that. I, I feel that you know, through the Q-score analysis and the uh, uh, social media analysis that they're just not comparable. <clears throat> Tom, we can take that one down. Mr. Banya, based on um, all the analysis you did in this case, what, what are your overall opinions? Yes, my overall opinions are that uh, Mr. Schnell failed to prove any causal connection with the Waldman statements and the uh, uh, search or the uh, hashtag activity, those spikes, as it relates to Twitter. There, there's no causal connection there. Um, my second opinion is, you know, based on my uh, social media and Q-score analysis, uh, Ms. Arnold's comparable, alleged comparable actors are not comparable. And then third, uh, Ms. Arnold and Mr. Schnell both failed to prove any causation as it relates to the Waldman statements causing economic harm to Ms. Heard. So, you know, as a damages expert, which um, uh, Ms. Arnold is, uh, you, you need to take into consideration causation before you can calculate damages. You look at damages and you look at this allegedly damaging event, and not only do you have to prove that 100% of the damage is because of these Waldman statements, she didn't even consider uh, COVID. It happened at the same time. You know, a lot of actors probably made a lot less money because of COVID. Maybe films didn't get made. And, you know, when you do, do an analysis of, of damages, you prove causation, but you also have to look at everything else that might have caused this alleged economic harm. And she didn't look into any of that. She didn't even know what causation was. So I don't think of the damages is the, an appropriate approach in this case. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, cross-examination. Good afternoon, Mr. Banyan. Hi. Yeah, you're not a damages expert, correct? I am a damages expert, but not providing any quantitative damages uh, opinions in this case. In this case, okay. And is it your testimony that only if a person repeats the Waldman depth statements could they be related to the defamation? Say that one more time. Are you saying that a person literally has to repeat the Waldman depth statements in a, tw in a tweet for them to be related to the defamation? Uh, no, if you looked at my analysis, I did pick the three themes as it relates to the tweets, and I uh, analyzed those themes, and I came up with five examples of when th those themes were used. And you ran searches for, quote, abuse hoax, sexual violence hoax, and fake sexual violence, and you ran all those in quotes, correct? I did. So only if a person used a tweet with those words in that order and with that spacing would they hit on your searches, correct? Objection compound. Overruled. Yeah, so I used them in quotes because, you know, the hoax could be used in many other contexts. So I wanted to make sure I was fitting my search with the theme of the Waldman statements. So if someone tweeted misheard faked sexual violence, that wouldn't appear in your that wouldn't appear in your searches, correct? Faked with an ED. Uh, it would not. And, any, and if they use two spaces between abuse and hoax, that wouldn't fit in your search? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> Did you, and a, tweet's 200 and a tweet can only be 280 characters, correct? That's correct. All right. So certain of the Waldman Depp uh, statements, a person could not tweet the whole thing in one tweet, correct? The whole statement in one tweet. 
The Waldman statement? Correct. Um, no, you, you could not okay. tweet that in those entire quotes. Did you make any determination if there was an online bullying campaign against Mr. Depp after Ms. Hurd's op-ed? I didn't look into any uh, online bullying campaign for Ms. Hurd nor Ms. Mr. Depp. Did you determine if there were tweets harassing Mr. Depp that quoted from Ms. Hurd's op-ed? No, my assignment was to determine if the Waldman statements were part of the, the, the tweets that Mr. Schnell provided. I was, I was rebutting him. And in your analysis of when you, when you testified before, you never looked to see if the op-ed was quoted anywhere, correct? Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? <laughs> All right, questions withdrawn. Next question. Um, now, you have no objection to Ms. Arnold's use of comparables, correct? Just the use of comparables in general. I listened to her testimony in my understanding that she abandoned that, uh, uh, that approach. But as it relates to my testimony today, uh, my opinion was related to those specific alleged comparable actors that they were not comparable. You're not offering an opinion as to who the appropriate comparables should be to Ms. Hurt, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, you, you testified just before about the Q scores of Ms. Hurd and the, comp and the comparables. That was uh, plaintiff's exhibit. 1296, correct? I don't know what uh, 1296 means. Okay. The, the, the demonstrative in front of you. Mine? Yes, that's correct. Um, and you said that those were all for the winter of 2019? I said Ms. Hurd's were from the winter of 2019. Because isn't it true that none of the rest of these people were from the winter of 2019, correct? That's correct. In fact, uh, Mr. Momoa's was from the summer of, tw of 2020. 2019, of 2020. That's correct. Not all alleged comparable actors had Q scores for that date. What was important for me is to get Ms. Hurd's Q scores right after Aquaman, but before the Waldman statements. So you weren't comparing apples to apples, correct? I, I wouldn't say that. I I'm saying that it's not the exact same years. Well, so. In the winter of 2019, that Q score comes out. That the field date, the field work dates for that is from January 22nd, 2019, to February 7th, 2019. Correct. That is correct. So that would be start. So the field work would be starting almost Im immediately after Aquaman just came out. Correct. Yeah, and her star is born moment. Yes. You'd agree that for the winter of 2020, where you took Jason Momoa's Q score would have more time to account for the rise in popularity of the film Aquaman, correct? Well, actually, if I use Ms. Arnold's suggestion, uh, the, the celebrities tend to have, you know, the, the, the celebrity moment right after they have their breakout film. So uh, I disagree with that. I think maybe his Q scores could be lower as it relates to when I use them. You'd agree that for the winter of 2020, Mr. M Momoa's Q score would have more time to account for the rise in popularity of the film Aquaman? I don't know if it accounts for the rise of popularity. Again, using Ms. Arnold's uh, words, uh, usually a Q score will be the, the highest after, right after the film, like I did measure Ms. Hurd. May I have a All right. Do you show? Thank you. All right. Thank you. If you look on page 177 of your deposition transcript, you see that? I don't see a page. Is that what you handed me? You don't see page 177? Um, I think four pages. Four pages per. Oh, yes. Thank you. And I asked you at lines 6 through 10, you'd agree that for the Winter of 2020, Jason Momoa's Q score would have more time to account for the rise of popularity in the film Aquaman, and you answered yes. 
Uh, at that time, as I am a rebuttal expert to Ms. Arnold, based on her testimony, I've learned something new from her. Okay. You did, and you didn't look at Ms. Hurd's Q score for summer of 2020, correct? She doesn't have any. And Ms. Armis had a lower, lower familiarity score than Ms. Hurd, correct? Um, if I don't have that in front of me, but if you're saying that, yes. Okay. And Ms. Armis' career tra trajectory has gone up since the summer of 2020, correct? I, I don't know. I didn't analyze her career trajectory. Okay. Um, could we, could you put up plan, uh, trial exhibit 1297? That was the demonstrative. Ms. DeArmas has less Instagram followers than Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct. And by, Ms. Hurd has more than double the Instagram followers of Ms. DeArmas, correct? Yes. Okay. And isn't it true that you get more social media followers the longer you're on social media? I'm not necessarily. It, it doesn't work that way. It, it depends on many other factors. And, and so Ms. Armas had a lower familiarity score and less Instagram followers, yet your testimony is that she would not be a proper comparable to Ms. Hurd? That's correct. Okay. And you're not offering a different set of people who should be comparables, correct? That's correct. Okay. You, thank you. you can take that down. Now, you understand that Mr. Waldman has been banned from Twitter for life for harassing Amber Heard, correct? I, I don't know that, uh, but if that's the case. And you understand that Mr. Waldman appealed the decision to Twitter and they have confirmed his ban for life? Objection, Your Honor. May we approach on this one? Okay, sure. You agree that in looking at Mr. Schnell's data, 65% of the uses of negative hashtags relating to Ms. Heard occurred between April 1st, 2020 and June 15th, 2021, correct? Correct. Okay. And you would agree that five of the six highest spikes of the negative hashtags were after the Deb Waldman statements, correct? Correct. Okay. And where you talked about the February 2020 spike, and the 65%, by the way, even includes the February 2020 spike of tweets, correct? That's correct. But, well, there was no spike in Feb 2020 during the Waldman statements? Well, the, fe the spike in February 2020 was before the Waldman statements, right? I would have you, can we pull up the chart again if you want to talk about the spikes? Sure. Can you put up 1294? Number one. Number one. Yeah, that spike happened before the Waldman statements. Okay. And there was hardly any activity in negative hashtags until February 2020, correct? That's correct. And you understand that the spike in February 2020 was related to the partial tape that Mr. Waldman and Mr. Depp leaked to the Daily Mail, right? I'm aware that the articles were related to um, Heard admitting to hitting Depp. And you understand that Mr. Waldman testified that Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman met with the Daily Mail in person to provide the partial tape to the Daily Mail. Objection, Your Honor. Okay, she's talking about, he talked about what's, what the number one what, related what, to. What's the objection? Sorry, lack of foundation. And I'm, asking, I'm asking if he knows, if he knows or he doesn't. All right, uh, we'll rule. So what's important to me is the fact that this spike is I, I, prior to sir, the Waldman sir, statements. Uh, do you know if the do you know if Mr. Waldman testified that Mr. Depp and he met with the Daily Mail in person to provide the partial tape? No. In February of 2020, you don't know one way or the it's other. It's irrelevant to my opinion. Okay. And the spike in July of 2020 came right after the last defamatory statement 
by Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman, correct? Uh, the July spike, which is number two, uh, is not related to the Walden statements, and it, uh, there are articles related to abuse between Heard and Depp and feces found in Depp's bed. And that's based on Google searches you did? That's correct. Okay. And the July, but the July spike in time came after the June 27th, 2020 defamatory statement by Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman, correct? That's correct. Okay. And, as, and five of the six spikes came after the defamatory statements, correct? After the Waldman statements, yes. Okay. Now, you testified before that you eliminated shares and likes of the Depp Waldman statements from your analysis, right? Repeat that, please. Did you say that you eliminated shares and likes of tweets that included the Depp Waldman statements? That's correct. When I was doing my analysis, I noticed the exact same text was a part of many of these tweets. Don't, don't shares and likes disseminate the negative information? That's quite possible. Okay. And you agree, right, that use of the term Waldman or Waldminion occurred over 25% of the time in the negative tweets toward Ms. Heard from April 2020 through January 2021, correct? Although it's irrelevant to this case, it has nothing to do with the Waldman statements. That's what Mr. Schnell says. You don't disagree with his, you don't disagree with the search results, correct? Yeah, although it has nothing to do with this case or the Waldman statements, I do not disagree. So if people are tweeting about Adam Waldman and, or Waldminion at the same time as tweeting negative hashtags hashtags about Amber Heard that has, it's your testimony that they have nothing to do with this case? The hashtags have nothing to do with this case. That's, that's what you're saying? Okay. Uh, what, yeah. Okay. And even if they include the negative hashtags with Walt, Mr. Waldman's name and Waldminion, you're saying they have nothing to do with the defamatory statements? All four hashtags that Snell used had nothing to do with the Waldman statements. I, yeah. Waldman himself has nothing to do with the Waldman statements. We're talking about the Waldman statements here. Waldminion, I don't even know what that is, but again, it has nothing to do with this case and it's not related to the, the Waldman statements. That's and, what's and, important. And the reason you're saying they're not related to the Waldman statements is because someone didn't literally copy what Adam Waldman said in the Daily Mail and tweeted out? Well, I looked at, at enough tweets that included the name Waldman that have nothing to do with anything negative or the Waldman statement. No, they must, have, mean, had Mr. To, they must have had to have the negative hashtags toward Ms. Heard because the only way that those would have been in the data you looked at would have had the negative hashtags towards Ms. Heard. It, he wasn't look, he, it was looking at that universe, correct? Well, first of all, I don't agree that the uh, justice for Johnny Depp is a negative hashtag towards Amber Heard. So, listen, the assignment was to determine if the tweets that Mr. Schnell presented were related or included the Waldman statements. In your review of the tweets related to Ms. Heard, you cannot point to any that were positive toward Ms. Heard, correct? Again, I was not looking for that. And you did not review the hashtag Johnny... Justice for Johnny Depp during the time frame from April 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2020 to see if there were any that were not negative toward Ms. Heard. I did not look into anything as it relates to anything other than what relates to the Waldman statements. That's what's at issue here today as we sit in court. Okay. And you didn't form any statistical analysis to rule out the Waldman statements impact on the hashtags, correct? Correct. You did not analyze whether media and press coverage other than the Waldman statements affected Ms. Heard's career, correct? Correct. Okay. Looking at um, the exhibit in, that's in front of you, where you have the numbers here, those you said are related to Google, Google searches? The, the one through six? Correct. Yes. Okay. And can we put up um, plaintiff's 888? And we could just start at one. Do you understand that your, okay. Oh, thanks. And 888, it's page 76. These are the documents you relied upon for your opinion today? Yes. 
And are these the search, the, where it has the different letters, these are the searches uh, that you ran for the various time frames and the articles that came up for numbers one through six, correct? No, I mean, obviously document 1A is the Heard Supplemental Expert Witness Disclosure. These are, these are documents that I used throughout the time I've been working on this project. So not, these aren't related to those one through six numbers. Okay. These are documents you relied upon for your opinion today? These are the documents that I relied upon when I presented my, my designation. The, the, for, your, for your opinion today, that you're offering today? Yeah, these are the documents that, yes, I've relied on throughout this entire, this case. Okay. And actually, Michelle, could you turn in this designation to... Um, Let's see. Uh, hold on one second. Go. To, can you just scroll down? Yeah, I keep scrolling. Let's keep going. Keep going. Okay, stop. This was the chart you provided with your designation for your opinions in this case, correct? Yes. Okay. And it's it's similar to the chart that we had before that we had before with the one through six, correct? That's correct. And where it has the various boxes, it's talking about documents six E through six H, for instance related to Depp wanting to have Heard replaced on Aquaman. You yes. And you, you prepared this chart, correct? Yeah, this was part of my designation. I'd like to have this page um, as a demonstrative. Your Honor, I do have an objection, if I might be heard. All right, if you want to come forward, page 99.
Mr. Banya. Um, other than uh, so as I understand it, your the way you determined that the tweets were not related to the Waldman statements was that you looked at time and then you ran certain Google searches, correct? Correct. And then the top three hits came up. Correct. And you were, and then you looked through the article to see if the Waldman statements were there? So as it relates to any trending event, any defamation that's happened online, any allegations of, of uh, economic loss because something went viral, going to Google, looking at the spikes in time and going back in time to see what was happening on those top three sites will give you an indication of, of the best results that were being served at that time. So something viral that's happening would appear most likely in those top three results. And just so the record's clear, if we could put, go back to page 76 of this document. Numbers 6A through 6N going to the next page, those are the, those are the headlines of the searches that you found? Correct. Okay. And you, you don't disagree that, the, that negative tweets toward Ms. Heard have continued throughout, your, throughout the analysis of the tweets, correct? I'm not looking at whether they're negative tweets or those hashtags are negative. I'm determining if those tweets are related to the Waldman statements. Well, okay, and you, you haven't, there's no, you have no, so you have no opinion whether the tweets were ne positive or negative towards Ms. Heard, that's what, that's what you're saying? Yes, I'm just analyzing whether or not they're related okay. to the Waldman statements. Okay, thank you, nothing further. All right, redirect. I have no further questions of this witness, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Banya. Yes. Thank you. All right, your next witness. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a brief recess for you at this point. Uh, hopefully, we're going to get you in there and get it right back to you, okay? Do not discuss the case, and don't do any outside research. Sorry, do not discuss the case, and don't do any outside research. Sorry, we'll just take a short break. So just so that we're on the same page, you can have a seat. <laughs> Keep standing the whole time. All right, just so we're on the same page with Mr. Knight's testimony. Actually, could Mr. Knight go back out, please? All right, all right. So we're on the same page with Mr. Knight's testimony. Um, there is a rule on witnesses. However, Mr. Knight's a rebuttal witness. Um, the purpose of excluding witnesses uh, from the courtroom, usually it's a courtroom, is to deprive a, a, a later witness of the opportunity to shape testimony to correspond with that of an earlier witness. Um, the issue we have here, obviously, if it was a direct witness in the direct testimony, you had time to do a rule on witnesses, let them know about the rule on witnesses. With a rebuttal witness, it's a little different because um, they didn't know they were going to be a witness. You didn't know they were going to be a witness. I understand that part. The problem is the courtroom in this particular case appears to be the world. So what we have to do here is um, I'm going to do a voir dire, and I'll, let, I'll allow both sides to ask questions as well, of Mr. Knight to see what he has seen of the case. And I'm just going to use the factors um, that the case law in Virginia uses, which uh, the factors to consider, because the court does have broad discretion to permit or prohibit a witness um, to testify in this particular circumstance. So the factors I'm going to consider is if the impropriety was intentional, which we'll find out, uh, the prejudice attached to it, 
also if the excluded witness learned about substantive aspects of the case from an earlier testifying witness and whether that knowledge had any effect on his or her testimony. So those are the three factors I'm going to look at in weighing this decision. Um, so keep that in mind when you do your voir dire. And it's my understanding that the evidence that Mr. Knight will testify only relates to Hicksville. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Now we can have Mr. Knight. Come on. All right, sir, Mr. Knight, if you could come forward to be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this case in the penalty of law? I do. All right, sir, if you could just have a seat, please. Right, sir, I'm, what's, what we're doing is I'm just going to ask you a few questions outside the presence of the jury, and then the attorneys are going to ask you a few questions, okay? Sure. Then I'm going to have you step back outside after that, okay? No problem. All right, what's your full name, sir? Uh, Morgan Higby Knight. Okay, you don't have to be that close. All right. All right, how do you spell your last name? N-I-G-H-T. Okay. All right, and sir, um, before I can allow you to testify, I just want to ask you a few questions. Um, have you seen any of the trial that's been going on for the past six weeks? Um, approximately five weeks ago, a friend of mine texted me that Hicksville was mentioned, and I watched a little clip where okay. it was mentioned. Which clip did you watch? Um, I believe it was uh, somebody testifying about, I think it was the security guard testifying maybe about Hicksville, or um, I forget exactly who was testifying but it was something where Hicksville was mentioned and uh, it was uh, about something about a wrist or something like that. All right. And what did you do after that? At some point, did you get in contact with attorneys? So I didn't reach out to them. Um, I didn't really care. The, okay. uh, the innkeepers that worked at Hicksville before reached out to them and said, we saw some stuff that wasn't true. And then they asked, is it okay if I give the attorneys your phone number? So the attorneys reached out to me. Okay, and when did the attorneys reach out to you? May 3rd. May 3rd. And yeah. you talked to the attorneys at that time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not Camille, but um, Gerilyn. Okay, and then have you seen any other parts of the trial? No, she instructed me not to watch anything about it, regardless no. of if it was about Hicksville or not. So I haven't, I've been Since keeping off, off the internet and turning off uh, anything that seems to be like it's on social media, so I just don't watch any of that. Okay. All right. And questions, Ms. Yes. Breder? So, Mr. Knight, you were contacted by an attorney for Mr. Depp on May 3rd? Yes. Okay. And you said it was Carolyn? Gerilyn. Gerilyn. Oh, Gerilyn. I got it. Okay. And... What? I think it's pronounced Gerilyn. Okay, can you tell us the conversation you had with her at that time? Yeah, she um, just asked me my recollection of the evening, and I told her, and she said, okay, um, would you mind testifying? And I said, sure. And she said, uh, okay, well then, we're not sure if we're going to call you or not, but just in case, please don't watch anything having to do with the case. And I said, I will do. Um, now, how is it that, to your best knowledge, how is it that Gerilyn was able to get hold of you? How, how, did, how did she know that you knew something? So, like I said, two of my innkeepers, my innkeeper and my manager, had reached out to her team, um, I think through email, and one of them uh, texted me and said, hey, do you mind if we give Gerilyn, your phone number. Now, you also communicated uh, on Twitter, did you not, about this case? Yeah, two weeks prior to Gerilyn reaching out to me, um, someone had made a comment about something that happened by the fire pit, and I said, that's not my recollection. I didn't see, that's not, that's not what I saw. So who was it that made a comment about something that happened at the fire pit? 
So once um, I was told about uh, the fact that Higgsville was mentioned, I went and did a Twitter search of Higgsville trailer. So it was, I don't know who it was, but I was just like, what are they saying about Higgsville? And so that was um, why I did a search just to see, because it was weird and fascinating because the night to me um, wasn't that remarkable in the context of all the different experiences I've had at the trailer palace. So explain to me, please, what you mean by you did a trailer search. So if you go to Twitter and you put in keywords and do a search, all the um, tweets regarding that subject come up or anything with those keywords in it. So that is how I found the tweet that I replied to. Okay. And how many tweets did you find that mentioned Hicksville when you did that trailer search? Probably like five or six. I only replied to one of them. Okay. And what do you recall those tweets saying about Hicksville? Um, the one that I replied to said that uh, there was some incident by the fire pit and, uh, and Johnny was yelling at Amber. Um, and I replied that my, that I didn't see that I was there all night and I was, you know, I was working that night, so I didn't see anything like that. So your best recollection on that one was that somebody said somebody was testifying that Johnny was yelling at Amber? Yeah. And I, I believe, um, grabbed her or something along those lines. Okay. Do you recall who said Johnny was yelling at Amber and grabbed her? I have no idea it was a stranger, so I didn't really pay attention to who was writing it. All right, and you said that you responded to it. How did you respond to it? I said that's not what happened. I was there all night. Um, uh, yeah, basically. I'm that, paraphrasing. It was a, a Did few you say ago. anything about what you thought happened? I just said that didn't happen. I didn't say what I mean, I think I believe I said maybe something along the lines of uh, from what I saw, Amber was the one acting jealous, not Johnny. And you said this to one of the tweets. Yes. Do you recall whether that was the Umbrella Man? I don't recall. That's a ridiculous name, though. OK, so tell me about the other five uh, tweets that you recall seeing when you ran your trailer search. Um, I think they were similar in nature, but I didn't, I don't specifically remember the details of them. Uh, that was pretty much the only one I remembered and that's the only one I replied to. Do you remember anything about the other five and what was said? No. Okay. When you said that somebody told you about a security guard, what was your understanding of what the security guard said? Um, I just, I got a text that uh, somebody in the trial had said uh, that they were talking about the Trailer Palace at, during the trial. And so that's what led me to go on Twitter and do a search. And did you have any communications with the two innkeepers about what you knew or what you thought? No, I hadn't talked to them in years and so, still haven't regarding the case. So. How is it that the innkeepers then contacted you and said, do you mind if we give you the telephone number to the attorneys? Because they still have me in their phone and um, Christy, who was the manager at the time, is the one that texted me and said, um, hey, do you mind if we pass this along? They, um, Mr. Depp's attorneys want to talk to you. Do you mind if we pass what along? Your phone number. Right, but how is it that, what is the communication you had with the innkeepers that even led them to understand that you believed you had knowledge about Hicksville, the Hicksville incident? There was no conversation. They knew because they were both working that same night. Um, Jenna was the innkeeper and she was there along with me that night. Christy was the one who texted me and she had come in the following morning for her shift. And I slept over. I was um, living in Keeper that night. So I'm trying to understand. So just based on the fact that seven years ago, they happened to know that you were working that night. Nine years ago, and it's because okay. I was there okay. with them. My math, well, it's 2022 right now, and that was what year? Oh, that was 2013. 2013. You're right. Okay. So 
Well, how is it that out of the blue they remembered nine years ago uh, that that you worked there that night and that you might have some knowledge? I mean, to be honest, like we do get um, celebrities sometimes, but it was, you know, it's not that unmemorable. It's not like it's any other night of the week. So I'm sure they remembered the specifics of that night. Had Mr. Depp's attorneys ever attempted to contact you before? No. Had you ever attempted to contact Mr. Depp's attorneys before? No, I had no interest. All right. Have you had any conversations with Mr. Depp's attorneys other than the one you described with Geraldine? Um, since? Yes. Well, I met with Camille last night. All right. And what did you, what was that conversation? Please describe. I just went through, um, you know, the story again that I had told Geraldine. And w let's let's hear what that story was. You want me to go through yes. the whole story? Um, Your Honor, we would object to attorney work product. No. There's no attorney work product. No, I'll overrule that. All right. Oh, that's, good. that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, that I, I described, like, them getting to the trailer palace, uh, the... Uh, me showing them around, the interactions I had when I was on duty with Mr. Depp and Mr. Her or Ms. Hurd, um, how uh, the evening progressed throughout the night, the levels of drinking and drug use that I witnessed, um, the, uh, um, what the state of the damaged trailer the next morning, um, and basically just, yeah, the details that I, I, I had only, um, you know, spent total 45 minutes to an hour with Mr. Depp um, and Ms. Heard throughout the, e throughout the entire course of the night. So it was my um, recollection of those events during that time. And what did Ms. Vasquez say to you? Your Honor, this is uh, beyond, we object on the grounds that it's beyond the scope of the voir dire. No, which is limited I think whatever to the three she criteria. said to him but is May I very please finish critical. stating my objection, Your Honor? Go ahead. Yes, sir. The objection is that it's beyond the scope of the voir dire, Your Honor, enumerated the three criteria which are relevant here. And this is a rebuttal witness, so. Your Honor, whatever Ms. Vasquez shared with him is going to be very important here because they knew by this time he was going to be a witness. So, well, that, that was what, last night. So, right. how does that fit into one of the three factors of deciding whether or not he's going to testify? Well, one of the three factors, you're, well, Your Honor, may I approach so that the witness doesn't hear? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Mr. Knight, did yes. Ms. Vasquez uh, provide you with any information that anyone had testified to or uh, said at any point? No, she didn't talk about anything except for asking me my experience and, and just getting a clear understanding of what my experience was. She didn't mention anything outside of the scope of what I saw and just asked me for the facts and told me, just tell the truth and let me know, you know. Do you know what any of the witnesses said in this trial? About, I mean, outside of what I described earlier with the, um, a friend of mine texting that someone was talking about Trailer Palace, I do not. Do you know whether any of the witnesses testified about any jealousy? Uh, other than the tweet that I replied to, no. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, may we approach? All right. Well, do you have any questions? Oh. All right. Sir, if you could ha have a seat back outside the courtroom. Sure. Thank you. Can I leave my water? Yes, you can leave your water.
All right. So based on weighing the factors, I'm going to allow Mr. Knight to testify. If we could get Mr. Knight back in. Now, if I knew you were going to do a sidebar, I wouldn't have made him leave. I never know. All right, sir, if you could just stay up, you could just stay there while we get the jury, okay? All right, are we ready for the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah. Just we're going to swear him in again in front of the jury, okay? seated. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for the interruption. You're going to notice as we get closer to the end of the testimony, you're probably going to have some more interruptions, and I, I apologize for that, but there's just some matters we have to take up outside your presence, okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. All right. Mr. Knight, if you could come forward to be sworn. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this case in the penalty of law? I do. Sir, if you have a seat. Good afternoon, Mr. Knight. Good afternoon, Camille. Would you please state your full name for the record? Morgan Higby Knight. Mr. Knight, where are you from? I live in Los Angeles, California. And what do you do for a living? So I currently own and run Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast in Idlewild, California. And I created and ran uh, Hicksville Trailer Palace in Joshua Tree, California starting in 2009. And how is Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast different from Hicksville Trailer Palace? So Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast is um, up in the mountains of Idlewild, which is a beautiful like snow town above Palm Springs. And um, all the units are A-frames instead of trailers, which we have. It's obviously a very different climate than Joshua Tree, which is a desert area. Um, the rooms which are themed at both places are uh, trailers, vintage trailers from the 50s through the 70s at Hicksville Trailer Palace. So um, there's also different kind of amenities. There's a pool in Joshua Tree. Um, there's a rec room up at uh, Hicksville Pines. When did you first become the owner of the Trailer Palace? Trailer Palace, I started building it in 2009. It took about a year with uh, my collaborator, Stephen Butcher, and on the trailers. And we got done and opened um, in 2010. Did there come a time that you sold the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Yeah, I did at the beginning of 2020. I um, had some health issues and just it was too much to run both at the same time. So I chose Idlewild because it was newer and shinier. And just for my sake, um, how long did you own the Trailer Palace? So 10 years of us being open, 11 years total. And what was the Hicksville Trailer Palace? So um, it started out as a uh, artist retreat. I was a filmmaker at the time and wanted a place to get away and work on film projects outside of Los Angeles. Uh, I also put in a recording studio so musicians could record records there. Uh, I had lived in New Orleans for five years and there's an amazing recording studio there called Kingsway where all the 
musicians would come and they'd live in this big mansion and record the records. And I just thought that was a really neat thing for artists to be able to get away and create their, um, create whatever they're working on. Over the course of the uh, build out of all the trailers, themed trailers, which I'm a huge fan of this hotel called Madonna Inn. And uh, so I wanted to do really detailed themed trailers. It became too expensive to just make a living off of an artist retreat. So I decided before I was done to make it a hotel as well. And what were your job responsibilities, generally speaking, when you owned the Hicksville Trailer Palace? So I would um, be live-in manager some nights, um, a couple nights a week. I would also drive out from Los Angeles twice a week and bring supplies that you can't get out in the Yucca Valley area and Joshua Tree. Um, there's just a lot of things like, you know, Smart and Finals, Costco's and stuff. So I would drive that stuff out. Um, there's also no uh, USPS. So sometimes I'd have to get things shipped to my house and drive them out as well. Uh, I would also just do um, constantly building and creating new stuff at Trailer Palace, uh, whether it's new trailers or amenities. So I would be working on that stuff as well. I'm a big fan of the fact that Disneyland is always making it better and better. And when you were the live-in manager, does, does that mean that you spent the night at the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Yeah, we have a house on site um, where the recording studio was and there's a bedroom in there. So whoever is live-in manager those nights um, stays in the house and, and basically lives there. There's a kitchen and everything. Have you ever met the plaintiff in this case, Mr. Depp? I had met him really briefly at the Viper Room in the late 90s. Um, uh, I had worked with some of the people that performed there and was good friends with uh, this girl Robin from the Pussycat Dolls and um, some other friends in this band, The Imposters. So I was there and I met him once. How about Miss Hurd? Ever met her? I had never met her before. Um, they were guests at the hotel. When was the first time that you met Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard together? Um, in late May 2013, uh, when they were guests, uh, Mr. Depp's assistant Nathan had rented out the entire place so they could have a night um, there in privacy. And what do you recall, if anything, about Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard's arrival to the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Mr. Depp got lost, uh, so. Um, his security guard who arrived early asked me if I could go fetch them because he had an old car that um, didn't really fare on the dirt roads out there, which are pretty horrible. So um, I went out and made sure that they got themselves and the car back to Hicksville safely. Do you remember approximately at what time that was? It was three to four in the afternoon. What was Mr. Depp's demeanor when they first arrived? At Trailer Palace, he was super excited about the place, really complimentary, um, just had a lot of questions and um, was just seemed like he was in a really great mood. And how about Miss Hurd's demeanor? Anything stick out? She was pretty quiet. Um, she uh, just kind of didn't say that much when I was giving them the tour of the grounds and the trailer. And was anyone else with Mr. Depp and Miss Hurd when they first arrived? Uh, there's people that are arriving throughout the afternoon, so um, there was, uh, um, I think 10 to 12 people total ended up staying. Uh, the security guard had gotten there earlier and just to check out the place, but, um, but yeah. And did I understand your testimony previously that the entire trailer park was rented out by Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? Yeah, the whole place slept, I believe at the time, about 25 people, but there was only 10 to 12 in this party. And who was part of that party besides Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? Um, I'm really horrible with names, but I remember one of them was uh, Ms. Hurd's sister and the security guard I mentioned before, but I honestly forgot his name too. What happened when Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd first came onto the property? So um, I gave them a tour of, we give all guests a tour of their specific trailer and the grounds and um, show them around the, uh, when someone rents the whole place, they get a 
another trailer called the bar trailer, which is basically a place to set up their alcohol and stuff. And some people in the group were just putting their beverages in that area. And where were you when uh, Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd, did there come a time when Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd went to the bar trailer? Um, I didn't notice most of the time that it, my interactions with them, everything's kind of centrally located. So there's a fire pit, bar trailer and picnic tables all right in the same area. So they were generally around that area the entire evening that I saw them. And what did you observe of Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd as the evening progressed? Um, so Mr. Depp was super, uh, just super curious and really nice. Um, he was also really interested in my innkeeper because she was a musician. So they would talk about music a lot. At one point, uh, the innkeeper who lived at the next door property went home and grabbed her guitar and they had um, sung a song or two around the campfire uh, in the early evening. Um, there was another instance where Mr. Depp, the innkeeper, her name is Jenna, and myself were talking about books and music and Ms. Hurd came over and kind of interjected. She seemed a little annoyed that um, Mr. Depp wasn't spending time with her. What about Ms. Hurd's demeanor made you think that she was annoyed? Um, I think just generally she, uh, it's hard, like she, I think, I don't know, it, it was just, it was just like a gut reaction, like I, I can't describe it, but, um, you know. How long were you with Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd that evening, generally? So throughout the course of the evening, I was probably 40, mostly with Mr. Depp, but 45 minutes to an hour total. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, that's over the whole course until the end of the night after the check-in. Okay. And did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. De Depp interact with other people, guests on the property that evening? Yes, um, I saw him hang out with his security guard at one point and um, outside of the uh, time that him and Jenna were singing around the campfire, he was off by himself um, a lot of the time and Ms. Hurd was over at the, uh, at the um, campfire with her friends and seemed to have a good time. And if you haven't already, can you generally describe for the jury your observations of Ms. Hurd that evening? Um, yeah, she was, uh, she was, seemed to be having a really nice time with her friends around the campfire. Um, and yeah, everyone was in a pretty good mood. Did there come a time in the evening that you observed Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd have a disagreement or an argument? Yes. Um, I was speaking with Mr. Depp uh, just one-on-one -on -one, talking about Higgsville and um, Ms. Hurd uh, came over and she said that I want to talk to you and seemed really upset about something. So I went and um, back in the house because it was really, um, they went off on their own and they, she started yelling at him and I, I didn't want to hear it. It honestly was really triggering because I've been in an emotionally abusive Objection. relationship before. Objections. Move to strike. What's the objection? You're up for me. We approach. Okay, sure. Mr. Knight, will you please just explain for us what you observed when you saw Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd having an argument? Yes. Um, so Ms. Hurd asked him to go talk um, off to the side and she was upset at him and she was yelling at him. Um, and I personally had 
that in objection. Enough. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Okay. If you could just explain to the jury um, what you observed when you saw Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd having an argument. Okay. Um, he was kind of cowering and seemed almost afraid, and um, it was really like odd to see because he was older than her, obviously. So, um, but I just went back in the house because I didn't Objection. want to. You went to what he did. All right, I'll sustain us too. Understood. So after you observed the argument, fair to say you went back to the tra to your house on site? Yes, Sunday? I did, yeah. Okay. Um, what happened after that? So when I saw Mr. Depp um, on my next rounds, he apologized profusely and said, I'm really sorry about that. She was upset. Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Sustained. Next question. What, if any, type of reaction did Mr. Depp have? He was just really... Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. He's going to say it again. It's the reaction. It's not the statement. All right, if you could make that clear, that's yeah. fine. Just what type of physical reaction did Mr. Depp have after the argument between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? He honestly, throughout the rest of the night, became a lot more quiet and um, and was uh, just very more petulant. In the beginning of the night, he um, was a lot more outgoing and extroverted, and throughout, as the course of the night went on, he was less and less so and more quiet. Did you observe any of the guests consuming alcohol while on the property? Um, I assume they were. I mean, people had cups and there was alcohol set up in the bar trailer, but I didn't physically see them pour alcohol into their cup and cup go into the mouth, per se. Did you witness Mr. Depp drink any alcohol that evening? I couldn't say. Okay. Anything about Mr. Depp's demeanor that made you think he was perhaps intoxicated? Yes. Um, as the night went on, he, uh, I... I'm a former bar owner, so I'm even though I wasn't drinking that night, I'm very familiar with the uh, signs. So um, just as the night went on, like I said, he became more and more quiet, but he also, as we would have conversations, his uh, head would kind of sway a little bit back and forth, which was a little, you know, it was he was much less sharp than he was earlier in the night. Did Ms. Hurd appear intoxicated to you? Um, she did, uh, she seemed, I think when she was angry at him, it, it seemed like she was intoxicated, but that's just based on my experience and my own personal trauma dealing with abuse. Okay. Objection, Your Honor, move to strike. All right, I'll sustain the objection, we'll strike it from the record, please disregard that testimony. Did you observe anyone do or take drugs? I did not. Did you witness Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd interact other than the argument that you previously described for the jury? Um, the, at the end of the night, I heard a commotion. I was inside the house and came out. I couldn't tell what was going on. Um, and Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd were having a discussion about, um, about I, I'm not sure what, but then they went to their trailer. At that point, a lot of people had already gone to bed. So... Um, it just kind of petered out. Everyone went to bed, including myself, and I didn't hear anything else the rest of the night. What time did the evening come to an end? I'd say it was almost around 3 a.m. Did you ever see Mr. Depp grab anyone? Objection no. leading. Sustained. Did you ever see Mr. Depp become physical with anyone? Objection leading. Sustained. Next question. Did you ever witness Mr. Depp get angry that evening? Objection leading. Sustained. Okay. What, if anything, happened the next morning? Um, the next morning, we have checkout at noon at the time uh, before COVID. And so uh, around 11 o'clock, one of my innkeepers let me know that there was some damage. Objection, hearsay. Um, did something happen that caused you to go to Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's trailer? Yes, I was informed that... Objection, hearsay. It's not being offered for the truth, Your Honor. I mean, it, may we approach on this okay, one topic? Okay, sure. Thank you. <laughs>
what, if anything, happened the next morning, Mr. Knight? Uh, the innkeepers let me know that there was some damage in one of the trailers, and it happened to be Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's trailer. So I wanted to inspect the uh, trailer because I was extremely worried. Um, all those trailers that Steve and I worked on were like my babies, and um, the one they were staying in was the only one that was mostly original and restored 1950s style, and so I was uh, very concerned. So what did you observe when you went to the trailer? I observed that um, there was a light sconce by the bathroom um, in the bedroom that had been broken off the wall, and a couple pieces were on the floor, and they were, um, and yeah, it was basically just broken. The light fixture was hanging on the wall still, except for the pieces that were on the floor. Did you come to understand how that happened? Objection, yeah. foundation, and All right, light. foundation, I was just saying that's the foundation, how he knew. Did you ask how the sconce was broken? Objection, hearsay. Sustained. How often do light fixtures in the trailers break? Um, they break uh, pretty often. I mean, it's not like a usual thing, but things in the trailers generally get broken because it's all vintage trailers. And um, I would say as much as every couple weeks, there's some incident of damage in one of the trailers. In this case, Mr. Depp had told me that. Objection, Dave. Objection. Objection. Um, so anyway, yes. Beyond the light fixture, was anything else in the trailer damaged? No, everything else looked fine. In fact, we have a, a something we call a piggy fee uh, that we address to guests that if there's anything what we call inconsiderate or unusually large messes, we charge them extra for it for a $25 an hour cleaning fee, but they did not receive one of those because everything outside of light fixture looks fine. And what was your reaction to seeing the damaged light fixture? Um, to be honest, I was relieved because it was not a big deal. I just tucked, there was already another light in the room. So I just tucked the wires in the wall until I had a few months later time to um, buy, it was matching sconce with another one in the room. So I had to on eBay find a matching pair that would fit there. And uh, when I finally got around to it, I was able to get that and charge it to uh, Nathan who had, whose credit card I had. And what was your understanding of who Nathan was? Mr. Depp's assistant. Okay. And what did you charge Nathan or Mr. Depp for replacing that, that pair of light fixtures? The pair came out to $62. Okay. While you were on site, um, Mr. Knight, did you ever wear a mesh shirt? <laughs> No, I would uh, absolutely never wear that. <laughs> At any time during Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's stay on the property, did you see Mr. Depp become physical with anyone? Objection I did not. leading. Okay, we're rolled. That's fine. I'm sorry, that answer was? Uh, I, I never saw Mr. Depp get physical with anyone when I saw him. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Knight, you are a pretty big fan of Johnny Depp, aren't you? I am not. To be honest, uh, throughout the evening, I... Uh, I sorry, I, I just asked you one question. Oh, I, I, I didn't apologize. ask you the rest of that. I you apologize. wanted to participate in this trial, didn't you? I did not. I you was asked by the attorney, and I wanted to... They. Um, asked me and I said, I'll be happy to come and tell the truth. You knew this was on camera, that it was being broadcast to a lot of people, and you saw testimony, did you not in this case, and you seized the moment and responded to the umbrella guy, the lead person for Mr. Depp's Twitters, did you not? Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative compound. O overruled. Uh, Mr. Umbrella Guy is the lead the lead you one. know that he is he leads one of the most predominant pro depth Twitters out there. I have no idea. I don't care or follow the umbrella guy. In fact, you do follow a Twitter called Johnny Depp fan, don't you? 
Absolutely not. You don't? That's your testimony no. under oath? It is my testimony under oath. All right. And on April 21st, Mr. Depp testified in this case about Hicksville, didn't he? I wasn't here. And in fact, you tweeted in response to the umbrella guy <laughs> on April 21, 22, quote, that never happened. I was with them all night. Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy. Do yes, you recall I, writing that? I do recall writing that. Michelle, can well, you bring that up, please? We're going to call it Defendants 1903. 1903. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you to redact, leave in the umbrella guy and the date, and the bringing in the Hicksville. Your Honor, I'm sorry. I'm good. While she's working on that, did you write and direct a piece called Matters of Consequence back in 1999? I did. And didn't Mr. Depp's first wife, Lorianne Allison, work as a makeup artist on that? She absolutely did. And while we're looking at that, uh, Four days after you tweeted to Umbrella Man, I thought it was Umbrella Guy. The um, umbrella Guy. Okay. Well, all right, now we have this up. I'm going to ask you to take a look. What is Defendant's Exhibit 1903? Do you see that? I do. Okay. And that's from that Umbrella Guy on 421 22, correct? Correct. And it says bringing in the Hicksville incident accusations. Do you see that? I do. And there's clearly Mr. Depp testifying there, likely a video, right? Okay. And you respond, that never happened. I was with them all night. Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy. Do you see that? I do. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of defendants 1903. Any objection? Yeah, Your Honor, we believe the first part of the um that umbrella guy's tweet should be unredacted Re for context. Oh, un well. I have no it, idea what it, I was replying it, to. It's, it's hearsay. It's, it's rank hearsay, and the context Your Honor, is not necessary. You're on approach. Of course. Take a look. All right, you can make that redaction. Would that redaction any objection? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, 1903 will be in evidence with, as redacted. Now, so you reached out to the umbrella guy in this text, this Twitter, right? I wouldn't call it reaching out. Okay. And in fact, the umbrella guy is in Mr. A Mr. Adam Waldman. Do you know who Adam Waldman is? I have no idea. Well, he's testified earlier that he talks to the umbrella guy. That um, he what? He talks to the umbrella guy? Yeah. Were you aware of that? I honestly, this sounds like a... Like schizophrenia. Okay. Now, four days after this uh, 
event where you texted and your honor, yeah, it's in, okay, good. Four days after that, you tweeted something pretty nasty about Elon Musk, didn't you? I did. Okay, thank you. So you don't like Elon Musk, right? Objection well, relevance. Oh, I, I don't know Elon Musk. Overruled. Thank you. So that was uh, the context of that is that he had... I didn't ask you for the context. I apologize. Okay. Um, but you texted something that had swear words in it. Would you agree about Elon Musk? Yes. Okay. Now, let's talk about your uh, recollections here. 45 minutes to an hour. Your recollection is that Mr. Depp actually drove there? Yes. What type of car was he driving? An old one that was a convertible. An old convertible? I'm not a car guy, so I couldn't express okay. the model. All right, and your recollection was this was May of 2013? Yes. Okay, do you recall when in May? Late May. Okay. Now, you said that you spent a total of 45 minutes to an hour with Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd, is that correct? After the, mostly Mr. Depp, but that's after the tour and after they were checked in throughout the course of the night. Okay. And you don't recall any of the people that were there other than Ms. Hurd's sister and the security guard, correct? I don't recall any of their names. Do you remember how many of them were female? I believe it was predominantly female. Do you remember how many males were there? I don't, outside of the security guard. Do you remember what any of the other people looked like? Um, they honestly just seemed like youngish hipsters, like for lack of a better term. I know that previously a couple of them had stayed at Hicksville Trailer Palace. That's how they knew about the place. Okay. So you didn't, you don't recall seeing how much anybody had to drink that night, correct? I did not witness that. And you, do you recall the use of drugs at all? I did not witness that. Okay. Were you sitting at any point with these people at the campfire? I was not. Okay. Um, and when you said that, uh, that you saw Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd was yelling at Mr. Depp, where were they? They, she pulled him uh, for a chat and it was off um, towards their trailer, like a little bit off towards the dirt. How many feet were there between the campfire and their trailer? The campfire and their trailer? Yes. Approximately 75. Okay. So where in that 75 feet did Ms. Hurd pull Mr. Depp and uh, yell at him and he cowered? 20. Okay. 20 from, from the campfire. From the, the campfire. Yeah. So your testimony is that Ms. Hurd grabbed Mr. Hurd, pulled him 20 feet over, yelled at him, and he cowered. Yes, that's that's what I witnessed. And then did they go back? I, I went inside the house. So you don't know whether they returned to the campfire or they returned to their trailer? I do not. Okay. Um, and do you know whether there were any uh, disagreements or physical communications, anything of that nature at the campfire? I do not. Do you know whether Mr. Depp did anything to anybody else at the campfire? I didn't see anything. Okay, do you know whether Mr. Depp grabbed anybody's wrist and told them, asked them if they knew how many pounds of pressure it took to break their wrist? I wasn't there the whole time. Okay, do you, is it your testimony that Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd went last to their trailer, everybody else went before them? They all, the rest of the people, I think about half of them had already gone to bed and they went, um, they went, I can't, it was all around the same time at the end of the night that the rest kind of scattered. There might have been a couple of people that went right after them or right before, but it was all around the same time. Okay, so, so your recollection is that when Amber and Johnny Depp went back to their trailer, that dissipated, Every, everybody then left at that point? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, how far away was your house that you were staying in from the trailer that Amber and Johnny Depp were staying in? I'd say it was about 75 feet away. Okay. 
Um, and the next time that you saw or heard anything was when you went there in the morning and saw the broken sconce. Is that yes, correct? I didn't hear anything after I went to bed. Okay. And that's the extent of your knowledge? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions. All right. Redirect. <clears throat> Mr. Knight, how did you get involved in this trial? <laughs> um, I got a text from one of our old employees who I didn't talk Objection to Objection hearsay? Don't tell us what the text said, just how did okay. you get involved? I got a, I got a text uh, from, uh, I got a... That's still hearsay, you're under okay. objection. No. Overruled. Thank you, go on Mr. Knight. I was asked no. uh, if okay. it was... No. Objection hearsay? <laughs> I apologize. Um, uh, what did you... I got a text. Well, you received a text, okay. Yes. From and whom? From a former employee. Okay. And how long had it been since you had heard from this former employee? Approximately five years. Okay. And did you contact Mr. Depp or any of his attorneys? Objection leading? Overruled. I did not. How did you get in touch with Mr. Depp's attorneys? They got in touch with me. I Objection, hearsay. Oh, overruled. Go on, Mr. Knight. Uh, they, they reached out to me. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's I, okay. I don't have an objection right now. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Only if he talks more. Next question. And how do you feel about participating in this trial? Objection, relevance. It's extremely relevant, considering that they have accused him of I, I, being... Oh, overruled. Thank you. How do I feel about it? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to tell what I saw, and that's the extent of it. I really don't care <laughs> outside of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Knight. Nothing All further. right. I assume this witness is not subject to recall. Is that correct? All right. So you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Or is it going to be a deposition, or is it going to oh. Apologies, Your right. Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Okay, Thank Dr. you. Calls Shaw. Dr. Shaw. Okay. Dr. Shaw. Thank you, sir. All right, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. Can you please state your name for the record? Uh, my name is Richard John Shaw. Dr. Shaw, can you please describe your educational background? Um, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I went to medical school at the University of London in England. Um, I went straight off to high school. That's actually the system in the, the British medical system. I did two years of preclinical training um, and then three years of uh, clinical work with, pa uh, with patients. Um, following that, I moved to New Zealand to do an internship. It was an internship in um, neurology, medicine, surgery, and psychiatry. Uh, I spent three years in New Zealand, and I um, did a, a year of psychiatry residency training. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and... <coughs> Following that, I um, <coughs> excuse me. Following that, I moved back. I moved here to the United States for the first time and did a residency in adult psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which is in New York. Um, that was four years of, of training um, in the Bronx, and um, I also did some subspecialty training in um, family therapy, couples, and, and family therapy um, as in my fourth year. And after that, I moved to California, um, and I've worked at Stanford. I, I studied at Stanford. I did a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry, um, and I've been at Stanford pretty much since then. Dr. Shaw, what is your current position? Um, I'm a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford. I also uh, run what's called the um, Psychiatry Consult Service at the Children's Hospital at Stanford. What, if any, professional certifications have you received? 
Um, I have um, what's called board certification in adults and general psychiatry. Um, I obtained that from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in 1991. Um, and then I obtained subspecialty board certification in child and adolescent psychiatry in 1993. Are you a member of any professional organizations in the field of psychiatry? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. I'm also a member of the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. How long have you been practicing psychiatry? Um, if you include my um, training in psychiatry residency in the US, that would be since 1985. Is that approximately 35 years? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, what percentage of your practice involves treating patients? Um, yeah, approximately three quarters of my time is working with patients. Um, I, I work in the pediatric hospital treating a combination of um, mainly children and adolescents with um, severe medical conditions, um, but also working with uh, parents of children who have medical, severe medical conditions. Um, I also consult to the pediatric emergency room and we evaluate patients who show up with um, suicide attempts and other serious situations. What does the remaining quarter of your practice entail? Um, well, as a professor, I have to do a number of um, academic activities. Um, so I do um, research. I do a lot of teaching. I give lectures. I um, supervise residents, medical students, and fellows in psychiatry. I, um, I do some administrative work. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty diverse you know, very day and week. Can you tell the jury a little bit about your research and academic work? Yeah, a lot of my research has involved um, looking at the issue of trauma and PTSD in parents who have uh, medically fragile children. Um, uh, a lot of these parents are naturally really affected by their, their, um, their child's illness and develop trauma symptoms. Um, so I've developed some interventions to try to help parents um, you know, provide support and treatment to reduce their symptoms of trauma. Have you published articles or books in your area of expertise? Yes, I have. I've, I've published um, approximately 70 or more, probably closer to 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts in different scientific journals. Um, I've also published a number of book chapters on, on various topics, um, approximately 30. And I have um, published three textbooks, um, one of which has gone into a second edition on topics that are related to my area of expertise. And one of them actually is, a, is about the treatment of PTSD in parents of uh, premature infants. Have you published um, a book through the APA? Um, actually, all of those books um, were published through the, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association. They have a, a publishing house, and that's been my um, publishing uh, company. What is the APA? Um, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, not to be confused with the American Psychological Association, is um, a professional organization that represents psychiatrists in the U.S., um, the last time I, I looked at this, I think there's about 37 or 38,000 members. And the, the, the APA has many different roles. Um, one of it is advocacy um, in psychiatry in, in the US, but it also has an important role in terms of education. So they, they host an annual scientific meeting every year in which psychiatrists will present their research. Um, it publishes a number of journals in the field and um, from time, well, fairly frequently it publishes um, guidelines for, for professional practice or about ethical guidelines that they um, hope their members will follow as part of their practice. What ways are you involved with the APA? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I mentioned my publishing. Um, I, um, I also present at the scientific meetings. I, I last presented in 2021, during COVID, was, was virtually, but on the topic of group therapy for parents with trauma symptoms. Um, 
I, you know, I follow the APA and the, the various guidelines. I, I think it's a really influential and important in, um, um, institution. Going back to your credentials, what, if any, professional awards have you received? Um, I've been given a, a number, several teaching awards at Stanford University and um, my, um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry that I mentioned um, uh, honored me with an award for service to my specialty um, um, several years ago. I don't remember exactly when. Have you given any public presentations in the field of psychiatry? Yes, I, um, that's part of our work as an academic psychiatrist is to, to lecture, to give presentations. So I, I present um, fairly frequently at annual scientific meetings, as I mentioned. Um, I've been invited to give grand round presentations at different medical centers, um, including University of Pennsylvania and Harvard. So that's just part of our, I think our role is to try to educate um, our colleagues about our work. Have you testified as an expert in the field of psychiatry before? Yes, I have. On how many occasions? Um, I would estimate, um, in terms of de deposition and trial testimony, approximately 50 times in the past 15, 20 years. What type of cases did you testify as an expert in? Um, they're pretty varied. So um, some of them have been medical malpractice. Um, I've also done a number of cases evaluating uh, victims who've um, been uh, subject to physical or sexual assault or trauma. What work were you asked to do in this case? Um, my role in this case was to give my opinions about the testimony and opinions from, of Dr. Spiegel, whom you heard from yesterday morning. And what work have you done to form your opinion? I, um, I was present yesterday in court listening to his testimony. Um, I have viewed his um, depositions. He had two depositions earlier this year, and I, um, I watched those depositions. I've also read a lot of deposition testimony. Um, for example, testimony by Mr. Depp's psychiatrist, Dr. Blaustein, uh, by his physician, Dr. Kipper, and nurse, Debbie Lloyd. I've reviewed depositions by many of the um, therapists involved in this case, including um, Dr. Banks, the relationship consultant, um, Dr. Um, Cohen, who was Ms. Hurd's um, therapist, and I think Dr. Anderson, who I think provided some couples therapy. Uh, I've also reviewed um, the medical records of Dr. Kipper and Dr. Blaustein and some various email communications. Um, I think a lot of the information that has been talked about here. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to offer Dr. Shaw as an expert in the field of psychiatry. <clears throat> Any objection? Uh, we have to approach. Okay. So, any objection? Uh, no objection, Your Honor. All right. So, so he'll be he'll be moved as an expert. Thank you. 
Dr. Shaw, um, you testified that you observed Dr. Spiegel's testimony yesterday? Yes, that's correct. And to reorient the jury, can you please generally describe the main areas in which Dr. Spiegel testified? Uh, yes, he... Did you have objection, Your Honor? They heard what he testified to. What's his opinion? All right. Out? Foundation to reorient them? That, that's okay. We, we can move forward. Okay. Do you have an opinion of Dr. Spiegel's testimony? Yes, I do. And what is your opinion? I, I have a couple of primary opinions. Um, the first is, is, is that I, my opinion is that he violated the ethical principles that are outlined in the Goldwater Rule when he gave his opinions about um, Mr. Depp, specifically with relationship to personality traits and his cognitive abilities. Um, my second primary opinion would be that, um, the re that the Dr. Spiegel's opinions um, were unreliable and that he had insufficient objection, information. Your object, objection, Your Honor. All right. You got to approach? Yeah.
Dr. Shaw, you mentioned the Goldwater Rule. What led up to the publication of the Goldwater Rule? Um, the Goldwater Rule um, came about um, in response to uh, an incident that, that occurred during the 1964 presidential election when Senator Barry Goldwater was running as a Republican candidate. And there was a magazine called Fact Magazine that started a campaign to discredit Senator Goldwater. And they obtained a mailing list from the AMA and sent out a single survey uh, questionnaire to, all, to about 12,000 psychiatrists in the US asking if they felt that Senator Goldwater was fit to run for office. And about 2,000 psychiatrists responded, 1,000 of whom expressed very negative opinions about Senator Goldwater and made comments such as, for example, he was a megalomaniac, he was a paranoid schizophrenic, that he had narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and as a result of that, um, he was replaced as a candidate um, and then went on to sue Fact Magazine for defamation of character. And he was successful in that lawsuit. Um, and in response to this incident, um, the American Psychiatric Association that I think was really concerned about how psychiatry was being represented and statements psychiatrists were making about someone they had never met or evaluated, um, issued the Goldwater Rule. And the main premise of the Goldwater Rule was that um, it was improper for a psychiatrist to render a professional opinion about a public figure um, unless they had personally and closely evaluated them. Um, what justifications did the APA provide, other than the ones you mentioned, for enacting the Goldwater Rule? Um, they wanted to make sure that uh, psychiatric illness wasn't being stigmatized. They wanted to um, ensure that individuals weren't defamed by statements made by a psychiatrist that, didn't, that weren't backed up by medical evidence. And they also wanted to preserve the integrity of the psychiatric profession, since I think the public in general and a psychiatrist speaks out publicly and expresses an opinion, a psychiatric opinion, um, people generally like to take that seriously. And the APA wanted to make sure that those opinions were credible and could be relied upon. Have there been any updates to the Goldwater Rule? Yes, yeah, since um, 1973, which is when the Goldwater Rule first came out, there have been um, a number of um, revisions and um, publications by the APA. They're called Annotations in Psychiatry, in which the Goldwater Rule has been better defined and expanded in, in some, to some degree. Um, so, for example, in 2017, in this, um, this publication, they, the APA reasserted that it was um, not ethical to provide a psychiatric or professional opinion about someone who had not been evaluated personally by that psychiatrist, that it was um, unethical to provide an evaluation without obtaining consent from that individual. Um, they also um, sort of really kind of defined what a, prof what a professional opinion is. And, that prof and, how, and how they defined it is that an opinion that a psychiatrist expresses about someone's speech, behavior, or any characteristic about that person, um, if it's that opinion is made using the expertise, experience, and knowledge inherent in the practice of psychiatry, that is considered a professional opinion. So it, it might include making a diagnosis or not making a diagnosis. And the other, I think, a couple of important things about that 2017 document were that the APA um, specified that if a psychiatrist is to give an opinion about someone, about the diagnosis or personality characteristics, whatever, 
that they have to follow an appropriate methodology. They have to do an evaluation that follows the standard practice of a psychiatrist here in the US. Um, and if they don't do that, they are considered to be um, a, you know, affecting the integrity of the, both the psychiatrist and the psychiatric profession. And, and this revision of the Goldwater um, rule definitely received a lot of support. The president of the APA at the time stated that breaking the Goldwater rule was um, irresponsible, um, stigmatizing, and, and definitely unethical. So that was a, state, a very strong statement from the president of the APA. What other medical organizations have weighed in on this issue? Yeah, the number of organizations have their own sort of version of the Goldwater Rule. Um, the American Medical Association that represents physicians in the US um, has an annual meeting um, uh, and it's, they, they have a, what's called a Council of Ethical and Judicial Affairs and they had a meeting in 2017 in Honolulu and they came up with their own statements about uh, the issue of whether physicians can provide opinions without directly evaluating somebody. And, and their opinion was that physicians should refrain from giving a psychiatric diagnosis um, about any public figure, including celebrities and people in the media. Are there exceptions to the Goldwater Rule? There are exceptions, yeah. And I think Dr. Spiegel um, had a lot to say about this yesterday when he was saying that if you couldn't express an opinion without evaluating someone, it sort of made the whole specialty of, or role of experts in the court sort of null and void. But there are exceptions and situations in which an expert can give testimony in court. So one good example would be if there was a medical malpractice case or if there was a case about, that involved a patient who'd committed suicide and the courts wanted to find out whether the psychiatrist had followed appropriate practice, the expert can review medical records and can give an opinion based on those records, provided those records um, have sufficient information, for example, about the diagnoses, about the treatment, about how the patient was responding or not responding to treatment. Did you form an opinion about whether Dr. Spiegel complied with the Goldwater Rule? Uh, well, well, my opinion is that he did not. He expressed a number of professional opinions about Mr. Depp um, that we heard about yesterday. Um, and again, he did so without um, an evaluation, without consent. Um, he did not follow the guidelines of the APA in the 2017 revision, where it was considered important that um, there be sufficient information obtained by that expert to give an opinion. Um, so I, I, I would definitely felt that they were, his, his conduct, unfortunately, did violate the Goldwater Rule. And specifically, what opinions of, um, that Dr. Spiegel gave yesterday did you, do you feel violated the Goldwater Rule? Yeah, I think that, well, there were sort of two primary ones. Um, the first that you heard about was that Dr. Spiegel had professional opinions about Mr. Depp's personality. And he talked a lot about how he believed that Mr. Depp had narcissistic personality traits. So, um, and, and he also, you know, talked a lot about narcissistic personality disorder. So, narcissistic personality disorder is a diagnosis in um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's called the DSM-5 for short. It's a diagnostic manual published by the APA. Objection, Your Honor.
Go ahead, Dr. Shaw, please continue. Sure, so I was, I was just talking about narcissistic personality disorder in the DSM-5. So the diagnostic criteria for that are, um, I'm not gonna remember every word about this, but essentially it's a, a pattern of grandiosity, um, a need for admiration, um, a, a lack of empathy that's demonstrated by that person since young adulthood. And the DSM-5 has nine specific criteria. And for someone to meet the diagnosis, you have to meet five of those criteria. And so when, as a psychiatrist, we're trying to make a diagnosis of any personality disorder or any diagnosis in general, um, the normal um, professional guidelines would dictate that we would do a very careful diagnostic interview. And there are actually interviews specifically written to assess personality disorders. Um, it's also possible to have um, the individual fill out questionnaires. There's something called the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. This is a 40 item checklist that um, taps into various components of narcissistic personality disorder. And it's also possible to get psychological testing um, like the MMPI that I think you heard about in reference to um, one of the other experts here. So with all of this information, um, including collateral information from um, family members, co work colleagues, um, information of that sort, it is possible to come up with a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. So in the case of Dr. Spiegel, he had none of this information, even though he came out and stated with what he described as a degree of medical certainty that Mr. Depp had narcissistic personality traits. And if you remember somewhat towards the end of his um, testimony yesterday, he was asked to, um, since he couldn't provide any um, documentation from the medical record about narcissistic personality disorder or narcissistic personality traits, he was asked about what um, is referred to a lot in, this, in his testimony as record evidence. So information that he obtained from depositions, from text messages, from emails, what, what, whatever. And um, so he was asked to give, I think, um, five examples of record evidence that would make it seem like Mr. Depp met criteria for narcissistic personality traits. And I'll just mention a couple of them, just, just, just to illustrate my opinion is that that testimony was, did not really hold together. So he stated, for example, that um, one of the criteria for narcissism is um, narcissistic personality disorder is a sense of entitlement. And the example Dr. Spiegel gave is that he believed that Miss Heard married him for his money. So clearly, a sense of entitlement is a, from a psychiatry perspective, that's very different from a belief that someone wanted you for your money. Um, a second example that um, was given was that he was asked to give an example of how Mr. Depp had shown that he was envious of others, which is another criterion for narcissistic personality disorder. And the example that Dr. Spiegel gave is that Mr. Depp was jealous of Ms. Hurd because he believed she was having an affair with Mr. Franco. Um, now, if we look at these two terms as a psychiatrist, there's a big difference between being envious and being jealous. As a psychiatrist, when I think about envy, I think about um, somebody wants something that someone else has, and it makes them feel bad. I think this is going beyond his All right. he, He's giving his opinion as to how Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule with respect to his testimony about narcissistic personality Which traits. He, he did, but now sustained the objection. Next question. Okay. Um, okay, and you mentioned two major examples. Um, what was the second one? The second one was confusing being envious from, with being jealous. Oh, oh sorry, um, Dr. Shaw, I mean, 
Um, you mentioned two major examples of ways uh, Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater Rule. What is the second? Oh, sure. Um, so the other big category had to do with um, Dr. Spiegel's evaluation of Mr. Depp's cognitive abilities. And he, his general opinion was that Mr. Depp had um, deficits in his memory, in his attention, in his processing speed, in his he, that he had word finding difficulties. Um, again, Dr. Spiegel did not evaluate Mr. Depp, and the information that he relied upon, um, there were two, two pieces of information. The first was that he watched a very long deposition that Mr. Depp gave um, the day after I think he had flown back from London uh, to the East Coast. And um, he made observations about Mr. Depp's behavior in that, ob in that deposition um, and felt that he could opine or give an opinion about processing speed and other, other cognitive aspects. Um, he also made reference to something you heard about yesterday, this thing called the mini mental status examination. This is a, a brief screen for um, memory and cognitive functioning that is often done. And uh, he testified that Dr. Blastein had administered the mini mental status examination. Um, and although, you know, from the records, all we know is that- Objection, Your Honor. Sustain the objection. Um, Dr. Shaw, without going into Dr. Blaustein's record, what information does a mini mental exam provide? Objection, Your Honor. It's beyond the scope of this designation. No. Overruled as to that limited question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the mini mental status is, um, it's, it's a series of about 10 or 11 questions and tasks that someone completes and you get a score out of 30. Um, what Dr. Uh, Spiegel testified was that Mr. Depp could not recall three words after five minutes. And he used that as an example of Mr. Depp having cognitive deficits that he specifically attributed to Mr. Depp's alcohol and substance abuse. And um, he really did not have sufficient information. I, I liken a, a mini mental status exam, is, it's like taking someone's temperature. If it's uh, elevated... Object, objection, Your Honor, I don't think it's going beyond. No, I'll sustain the objection. Um, now it's probably a good time for a break. If... Okay, sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know you had a break, but we didn't. So we're going to go ahead and take our afternoon break for 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay? You can stay right there, doctor. Your, your excuse for the 15 minutes too, sir, doctor. Okay, we'll come back at 4.17 then, finish the day? Okay.
You can be seated. All right, your next question. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, is the Goldwater Rule limited to diagnoses? It's not. It's it's um, includes all professional opinions. Do you agree with Dr. Spiegel that the Goldwater Rule doesn't apply to expert witnesses? I, I don't agree, no. How could Dr. Spiegel express an opinion without violating the Goldwater Rule? Um, this has actually been a, a topic that's been written and published about. So it is possible for someone to give testimony about a matter without interviewing someone. Um, and there's certain sort of ways that it should be framed. So for example, when uh, Dr. Spiegel was testifying about um, the report that Mr. Depp was unable to recall these three objects, what he could have done is said that I have not personally examined Mr. Depp, so I can't speculate about his um, cognitive state or um, ability to, to function cognitively. However, it is possible that someone who's not able to recall three objects um, could have issues related to substance use, which was what his opinion was. However, what he, could, what he should have done in expressing his opinion is then have followed up to say that in order to really establish whether these were relevant and significant cognitive deficits, Mr. Depp should have had psychological testing to establish the nature of these deficits. And he should also have added that there are other potential explanations for these Findings. So, for example, it's possible that Mr. Depp. Uh, objection, Your Honor. He's now going past the designation. Okay. I think he's just opining as to, um, or is responding to Dr. Spiegel's testimony yesterday. No, he's opining as to what Dr. Spiegel could have said, but it's past the uh, whether he's about the All right. I'll, I'll, if we can move on. Okay. Um, who is qualified to give an opinion about cognitive deficits and processing speed? Um, it would have to be someone who could um, conduct the type of neuropsychological testing that I was mentioning. You can't establish the presence of cognitive deficits without Objection, a battery of tests. Objection, again, this is beyond the cold water. Overruled. You, know, you can't establish cognitive deficits without appropriate neuropsychological testing. And that can only be done by a psychologist or neuropsychologist. So a psychiatrist like Dr. Spiegel would be giving an opinion outside of his area of expertise if he gave an opinion about um, cognitive deficits that required psychological testing to be further um, evaluated. Dr. Spiegel yesterday testified about the practice of forensic psychiatry. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. What is forensic psychiatry? Uh, forensic psychiatry is a specialty of psychiatry that relates to matters on the intersection between psychiatry and the law. So for example, what we're doing today is forensic psychiatry where a psychiatrist comes into court and gives an opinion about a matter to help the court make, come to an opinion. Are there professional standards that govern the practice of forensic psychiatry? Yes, there are. And what organizations have issued those standards? One of the primary organizations that has issued guidelines about um, the practice of forensic psychiatry is called the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. This is an organization that represents forensic psychiatrists. And uh, it has published guidelines about what constitutes um, an ethical and sound practice of doing a forensic assessment and providing a psychiatric opinion. Uh, so this guideline, I think, I think was published in 2015, um, actually, contains many elements that are consistent with the Goldwater Rule. So for example, it states that um, for a forensic assessment to be done, there has to be informed consent, and there should be a very thorough, comprehensive evaluation that would include reviewing past records, past psychiatric history. It would include doing what's called a mental status examination, which is a careful evaluation of someone's mood, cognition, things of that nature. And um, 
the guidelines do state that it is reasonable um, or permitted to provide an opinion without an evaluation, but if you're going to do that, there's some things that you have to really make clear in your opinion when you express that opinion. And the first is that you have to acknowledge the limitations of your opinion and not, like Dr. Spiegel, say that his opinion was held with a degree of medical certainty. You have to explain what's missing, what data you did not have that you were not able to rely upon in coming to that opinion. Um, you also have to talk about what additional information you would need to come to that opinion. And even though the, these guidelines say it's, it's permissible to do this, um, the, the, the text is still, um, I think, um, not fully in support of psychiatrists doing this. So their statements are that opinions rendered without a proper database, which is what we as psychiatrists rely upon to make diagnoses and, and give opinions, professional opinions, is questionable and not generally recommended. Did you form an opinion about Dr. Spiegel's testimony with respect to these practice guidelines? Yes, I did. And what is your opinion? Well, my opinion is that he did not follow those guidelines. So, um, for example, he did not have consent. He did not do even a, a, a basic evaluation of Mr. Depp. Um, when he gave his opinions, as I just mentioned, he, he said they were opinions that he had to a degree of medical certainty, and he did not um, make any statements about what other additional information he would have wanted to make that opinion. So, for example, when, when asked about should neuropsychological testing be performed, he said, most patients don't have access to that, which, are, which is actually not at all true. I mean, every medical school has neuropsychologists that can do testing. So I think that was um, an unfortunate statement. Um, so, so I think the, those are the, the primary ways in which the Goldwater Rule was violated and the, and the practice guidelines were not adhered to. Um, Dr. Shaw, yesterday Dr. Spiegel was talking about correlation and causation. What is the difference between correlation and causation? Objections? It's not in this designation. It is. We can approach and I can show you. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Dr. Shaw. Yes, yeah, so the, the difference between a correlation and causation, um, correlation is a statistical analysis of a relationship between two different factors. So in Dr. Spiegel's testimony, he talked about, you know, there being a correlation between opinions he had about Mr. Depp, his narcissistic personality traits, his substance abuse, things of that nature. Um, <laughs> So a correlation doesn't say anything about whether or not these factors caused that, you know, the, the behavior he was, was discussing. Um, perhaps one of the easiest ways I could describe this difference between correlation and causation is if we, if we look at the issue of, of measles, if you'll bear with me. So there's a correlation between being young and catching measles. Um, now we know that measles is not caused by being young. Measles is caused by a virus. But young children have not been exposed to the virus, they don't have the immunity, so they have a higher rate of measles. So the difference statistically is 
well, well, the difference is, is between causation and correlation is illustrated by that example. So another way I might put this is if, you know, if we had 100 people in a room, just bringing it back to the issue of um, IPV that Dr. Spiegel was testifying about. Let's say we had 70 people who had all the risk factors for IPV and 30 people who had no risk factors for IPV. So what can we say about the, those 70 people? We can't say that any single one of those people has perpetrated IPV, even though they may have all the risk factors. And if we look at the 30 people who have no risk factors, we also can't say whether or not they have perpetrated IPV. So the actual presence of risk factors for IPV that Dr. Spiegel was talking about, they say absolutely nothing about what happened in this case. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Nothing further. All right, cross-examination. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon. Uh, you're not offering any opinion as to Mr. Depp's psychology, correct? That's correct. Right. And you testified a lot about the Goldwater Rule. Um, you know of no case where a expert has been excluded from testifying based on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I don't know about the whole universe of cases. It's possible, but I don't know personally about one. And, and you, before this case, you've never offered an opinion on the Goldwater Rule before, correct? That's correct. And you've never written an article on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. And you've never given a presentation on the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. And you've never been on any committees regarding the Goldwater Rule, correct? I have not. Okay. And you, you agree that you've testified that there are exceptions to the Goldwater Rule about having to interview the subject, right? Yes. And you understand that Dr. Spiegel requested to meet with Mr. Depp twice, but Mr. Depp declined, correct? I'm aware of that. And Mr. D Mr. Dr. Spiegel stated in his designation and at, at trial yesterday that he did not meet with Mr. Depp, right? Yes. Okay. Um, can we put up uh, Defendant's Exhibit 1904? Dr. Shaw, have, have, you, have you seen the opinions of the Ethics Committee on the Principles of Medical Ethics? Yes. Okay. And if you could turn to 79 of the PDF, it's, and it's actually, thank you. You see where it's highlighted here? Yes. And it says, psychiatrists have also argued that the Goldwater Rule is not sound because psychiatrists are sometimes asked to render Objection, opinions. hearsay. He's an expert. Without conducting an examination of an individual, examples occur in particular in certain forensic cases and consultative roles. This objection attempts to subsume the rule with its exceptions. What this objection misses, however, is that the rendering of expertise and or an opinion in these contexts is permissible because there is a court authorization for the examination or an opinion without examination. And this work is conducted within an evaluative framework, including parameters for how and where the information may be used or disseminated. You see that? I do, yes. And, and this court authorized Dr. Spiegel to testify in this case, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. All right, redirect. Dr. Shaw, um, Mr. Nadelhoff just asked you about the court authorization of uh, Mr. Depp's evaluation. Are you aware that the court has twice denied Ms. Hurd's request for an evaluation of Mr. Depp? I heard that yesterday in, in testimony, yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Thank you, sir. You can either have a seat or, or you can leave. Thank you. Your next witness. All right.
state your name and address for the record. Jennifer Howell, Los Angeles, California. And what is your current occupation? I um, run the Art of Elysium, CEO of the Art of Elysium. Let me just go back. Now you've indicated that, that Whitney lived with you from January 2015. No. To, I'm sorry, May 2015 to April 2016. Are you absolutely certain about those dates? I am certain, yes. She came and went at different periods, but all of her stuff moved out of my house April 2016. And I'm sorry, did you say you were 100% certain of that? Ms. Hall, could you answer my question? Yes, she did go back to um, Amber and Johnny's at different points, but she was still living with me during that time. The question I asked, because you were talking at the same time Ms. Vasquez was, was giving an objection, was I believe that you said you were 100% certain of those dates. Is that correct? Same yeah. with me. All right. Oh, you previously testified that you were the CEO for Art of Elysium. Is that correct? That is correct. And are you still currently in that position? Yes, I am. And how long have you been the CEO for Art of Elysium? I am the founder of the organization. So um, we did our first workshop in August of 1997, filed the legal paperwork in February of 98 to set up a 501c3. So I guess since the beginning of the charity. Ms. Howell, when did you first meet Amber Heard? At the Pineapple Express premiere is where I met she and her sister Whitney. Do you remember approximately what year that was? I believe it was around 2008. I'm sure that could be pulled. It was the LA premiere. I think there was probably multiple premieres, but it was a Los Angeles premiere of Pineapple Express. Was Ms. Heard there with Mr. Depp? No, this was long before. Um, I was a guest of James Franco and Amber was in the movie. And so I met she and her sister at the, I mean, to be specific at the after party of the premiere. Did Miss Enriquez end up working for Art of Elysium at some point? Yes, she did. What year did Miss Enriquez begin working with Art of Elysium? I believe it was in 2014. I don't have those documents right in front of me. Um, I believe it was leading into the year Amber was receiving the award. And what was Miss Enriquez's position at Art of Elysium? Art Salon Manager, Director. Does Miss Enriquez still work for Art of Elysium? No. When did that end? Oh, 2015, I believe. Each time you saw Mr. Depp, did you ever see him doing any illicit illegal drugs? Never. Did you ever see him consuming excessive amounts of alcohol? Objection. Never. Did you ever see Mr. Depp appear intoxicated? No. Did Ms. Heard ever show you photographs of depicting injuries on her face or body? No. Did Ms. Heard ever tell you that Mr. Depp was abusive towards her? No. Is Mr. Depp paying your legal fees, Ms. Howell, for this deposition and the testimony you've provided in the UK action? He is not. Who is? Myself. Do you feel any particular sense of loyalty towards Mr. Depp? None at all. Do you feel any sense of loyalty towards Ms. Heard? None at all. Ms. Howell, do you recognize this check as the check that the Art of Elysium received on behalf of Ms. Heard 
for a donation, an anonymous donation of $250,000? Yes. Yes. I believe you testified previously that you understood that the anonymous donor was Elon Musk. Is that true? Yes. If I could please have exhibit four brought up. And for the record, it's based stamp JH 22 through 29. Do you recognize this document, Ms. Howell? And if you need to scroll through the eight pages, feel free. Um, can you scroll down? Yeah, I recognize that. And what is this? That is an email, I believe, I sent to Whitney. Scrolling up to the first page of this attachment, who is Marcel? Pariso? Sure, Pariso. He, he is one of my oldest friends in Los Angeles who has served as a board member of the Art of Elysium and is one of my biggest confidants here in LA, kind of for the course of my career. I'm going down to the third page of this exhibit. Thank you. This is an email, Ms. Howell, that you sent to Whitney Henriquez on or about Tuesday, July 28th, 2020 at 11.20, excuse me, at 11.02 a.m. It is. This is a true and accurate copy of an email exchange that you sent to Ms. Henriquez? Yes, I believe I'm the one who gave that. Yes, it is. And then did you forward email exchange and the attachments to Marcel Parasau? Yeah, I asked him to keep it for me. Why did you send this email and letter to Ms. Enriquez? Because I've struggled very much with what to do in a situation that I love someone who I know is doing something very wrong and I know that they're doing it because they're trying to protect their sister and I'm trying to protect her and I'm just trying to get her to wake up and do the right thing, which is tell the truth. It's the only thing that can help everybody involved in this case. Ms. Howell, do you recall submitting a witness statement in the United Kingdom? Yeah, they basically just called to verify the witness statement that was submitted previously. And do you recognize this document to be the witness statement and the declaration that you submitted in the UK? And if you want to scroll down to look at it. Yes, I recognize it. And at the first page, do you see a date on this document? January 13th, 2021. And is this document a true and accurate copy of the declaration that you submitted in the UK proceeding on or about January 13th, 2021? Yes. And are all the statements in your UK declaration accurate and true? I mean, yes, I signed it, yes. All right, let's pull up what I believe was DEP Exhibit 9. 
It's been marked as Dep Exhibit 9. Exhibit 9. So, Ms. Howell, earlier you were shown this document. Um, scrolling to the end of it. Can you go? I don't, okay. There. Mm -hmm. Did Mr. Waldman assist you in drafting this email? Mm, absolutely not. Did you speak with Mr. Waldman at all about drafting this email? About writing an email? No, I did that on my own accord. Did you speak with Mr. Waldman at all about contacting the ACLU? I do not recall having a conversation with him about that. And Ms. Howell, you testified earlier that you received a check from Fidelity Charitable in January of 2018, is that correct? Um, I don't know if I said the date, but yes, I received an anonymous donation from that check that was submitted, whatever it's on there. I just don't know the date off the top of my head. And you testified that there was a letter sent along with that, um, that said that, uh, it was on in honor of Amber Heard. Yes. Richard, I was guaranteed 20 minutes with them after being attacked for three and a half hours by your side the last time. So I am going to stick by what I was told before entering this and what your side agreed to. All right, your next witness. Uh, your Honor, Mr. Depp calls Candy Davidson Goldbron, who is the corporate designee of the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. All right, and that's by deposition, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Well, Ron, is it your understanding that you're here to testify today on behalf of the Children's Hospital? Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. So as of June 2018, had any payments been made by Ms. Hurd to the Children's Hospital um, in connection with the, the $3.5 million pledge, aside from the original $100,000 check from Mr. White in August of 2016? Yes, there was a payment, um, a gift on January 9th of 2018. And what amount is that gift that you're referring to? $250,000. Okay, and was that gift made by Ms. Hurd or on Ms. Hurd's behalf? By Ms. Hurd. Okay, and, and what are you basing that statement on? By the um, check that we received from Fidelity. Char uh, Fidelity Charity that um, came to Children's Hospital. What is this document? The letter to Mr. White uh, from myself inquiring about further installment on the pledge um, that had not been fulfilled. And why did you write this to Mr. White on June 14th, 2019? I was trying to figure out if there were any other payments coming from Mr. White to fulfill the pledge because we had, because Children's Hospital Los Angeles had not received any other correspondence from him. And what is this document? It is a letter to Ms. Gottlieb uh, from myself on behalf of Children's, Los, uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles inquiring about additional uh, gifts, pledge payment installment. This letter appears to be directed to Ms. Amber Heard, care of Jody Gottlieb. Is that correct? Correct. Um, who's Jody Gottlieb? In, in uh, the 
Children's Hospital Los Angeles record. Um, Jody Gottlieb was our contact for Ms. Amber Heard. Uh, Ms. Goldbron, um, why did you send this uh, letter to Ms. Heard and Ms. Gottlieb? I was trying to see if the pledge was going to be fulfilled or not. In your experience, is it common practice for anonymous donors when making donations to in one paragraph state that they wish to remain anonymous and in the very next paragraph identify themselves? Yes. That is common? It is common for donors to want to remain anonymous publicly, but allow the charity to know who they are. Between June 2018 and the dates on which you sent the letters to um, Ms. Heard and Mr. White in June of 2019, were any additional funds received from Ms. Heard? No. Okay, so as of June 2018, a total of $250,000 had been received as, as far as the Children's Hospital is concerned from Ms. Heard. And that was the same amount that was that had been donated a year later in June of 2019. Is that accurate? Correct. As of the date of this deposition, um, March 30th, 2021, how much in total has Ms. Heard donated to the Children's Hospital? For this particular guest? I mean, for the, in her lifetime? From 2016 to present? $250,000. Ms. Uh, Goldburn, do you recall we were speaking about this letter uh, a few minutes ago? Correct. All right, and, and this was a letter that you sent to Ms. Heard, correct? Correct. <clears throat> um, did you ever get a response to this letter? No. As of October of 2018, how much money um, had Ms. Heard directly donated to the Children's Hospital? $250,000. As of March 30th. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of that. Sorry, I, I just realized. You said October 2018? Correct. $250,000. Okay. As of March 30th, 2019, how much money <laughs> had Ms. Heard directly donated to the Children's Hospital? $250,000. What is your understanding of the length of time over which Ms. Heard pledged the gift of $3.5 million to Children's Hospital? There was no date arrangement with Ms. Hurd to have this pledge paid off in a particular time. If Ms. Hurd uh, were to pay this, the, the rest of the $3.5 million uh, in two years or five years, would, CA, would Children's Hospital welcome that? CHLA welcomes every and any donation that comes its way. Has Amber Heard's pledge of the $3.5 million to Children's Hospital expired, to your knowledge? Not that I'm aware of, no. It has not expired. All right, thank you. Your next witness, sir. Your Honor, I think we've concluded our witnesses for today. We will have more live witnesses tomorrow. Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, that'll be the end of your day for today. Again, do not do any outside research. Do not discuss the case with anybody, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., okay? Thank you. All right, you want to have a seat for just a moment because we do have a few proffers going to be done. Um, just, just for the record, we talked about it earlier. I will charge the 30 minutes extra time for today to the plaintiff's team 
so we can stay on time. I understood, Your Honor. Okay. All right. And I believe, Mr. Ronborn, you had some properties you wanted to do um, for testimony. Um, we did, for Your the, Honor, the testimony record. in a few exhibits. Mr. Nadelhoff is actually going to Okay, do that. Mr. Nadelhoff, if you want to proffer testimony for the record as to the testimony that the court has sustained objections. Here, Your Honor, it's, it's, gonna, it's a box here. So I just All right, that's fine. <laughs> you can stay there as long as you stay close to the microphone. Yeah. I appreciate it. And, and Your Honor, um, what I was going to, what I will do is I'll explain what we're proffering the evidence for, and then we have copies. Um, Good. Which I'll provide to you. We can, I, I'll provide. We'll provide them to you electronically, or I, I don't have another copy for you right now, but I will okay. provide. We'll provide. That's them fine. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay, um, uh, Your Honor, for Laurel Anderson on March thirty first, twenty twenty two, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial. Dr. Laurel Anderson. A clinical psychologist who worked with Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp. Dr. Anderson testified in, in the therapy session. Ms. Hurd reported to her that she was slapped by Mr. Depp, that he hit her in the head, had her hair pulled by Mr. Depp, kicked her in the leg, and that Mr. Depp gave Ms. Hurd bruises. Ms. Hurd also reported that Mr. Depp was the first to initiate any violence. Ms. Hurd also reported that she hid in a bathroom to protect herself from Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd also reported to Dr. Anderson that Mr. Depp threw a phone at her on May 21st, 2016, hit her, and held her hair. Ms. Hurd also reported to Dr. Anderson that she was a victim of Ms. that she was a victim to Mr. Depp's abuse. The testimony is contained in Dr. Anderson's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit A. The court also excluded records of Dr. Anderson from Ms. Hurd's and Mr. Depp's therapy sessions and a treatment summary, which are Exhibits B and C. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Anderson's testimony as described in medical records stating that they were hearsay and that they did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objection on the ground that the testimony and exhibits were hearsay. For Dr. Kipper, on March 31, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. David Kipper, Mr. Depp's physician. Dr. Kipper testified Ms. Hurd voiced concerns of Mr. Depp's behavior while on drugs and alcohol, that Mr. Depp tried to fight and push Ms. Hurd while he was attempting detox on his island, and that she found lots of cocaine in February 2016. Dr. Kipper also testified he told Mr. Depp to, quote, bury the dragon, which referred to the bad feelings that Mr. Depp has inside him. This testimony is contained in Dr. De Kipper's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit D. Dr. Kipper also testified about an email he wrote explaining Mr. Depp's detox treatment. In the email, Dr. Kipper wrote, to Mr. Depp's sister that Mr. Depp had fundamental issues with anger, romanticized the drug culture, and had no patience if his needs were not met. This email is Exhibit C, Mr. Exhibit E. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Kipper's testimony and the email stating it was hearsay, that it did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objection on the ground that the testimony and exhibits were hearsay. Uh, Deborah Lloyd. On March 31st, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Debbie Lloyd, Mr. Depp's nurse. Ms. Lloyd testified Ms. Heard voiced concerns about Mr. Depp's behavior while on drugs and alcohol and that Mr. Depp worked himself up into a rage and was trying to fight Ms. Heard while he was attempting detox on his island. This testimony is contained in Ms. Lloyd's deposition transcript, which, which is Exhibit F. Also, Ms. Lloyd kept nursing notes on these issues that she testified to which is Exhibit G. Mr. Depp objected to Ms. Lloyd's testimony in portions of the nursing notes stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objection on the ground that the testimony in portions of the note, nursing notes were hearsay. Aaron Borum Falati. On March 31st and April 1st, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Ms. Falati, Ms. Hurd, and Ms. Mr. Depp's nurse. Ms. Filati testified that Ms. Hurd reported to her on December 16, 2015, that Mr. Depp headbutted Ms. Hurd in the forehead. This also was contained in Ms. Filati's nursing notes, which is Exhibit H. Ms. Filati further testified that Ms. Hurd reported being freaked out after the December 2015 incident and testified to text messages between herself and Ms. Hurd, where Ms. Hurd reported the incident of abuse. These text messages are Exhibits I, J, K, L, and M. Ms. Filati also testified on, that on May 21, 2016, 
Ms. Hurd reported that Mr. Depp became completely delusional and crazed and hit Ms. Hurd in the face while she was on the phone with I.O. Tillett Wright. Ms. Filati testified to text messages reporting this as well, which are contained in Exhibit N. The testimony is contained in Ms. Filati's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit O. Mr. Depp objected to Ms. Filati's testimony, portions of the nursing notes, and the text messages referenced stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on the grounds that the testimony and portions of the nursing notes and the text messages were hearsay. Amy Banks, Dr. Amy Banks, on April 29, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. Amy Banks, a clinical psychologist and relationship consultant who worked with Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp. Dr. Banks testified that in therapy sessions, Ms. Hurd reported that Mr. Depp attacked her physically, including by hitting her with his hand. Mr. Dr. Banks also testified that Ms. Hurd reported that Mr. Depp cut his finger off and burned himself with a cigarette. Dr. Banks also reported that Ms. Hurd told her that Mr. Depp initiated the violence while in a session with Mr. Depp, and Mr. Depp did not object to the characterization of the violence. Finally, Dr. Banks testified that she believed Ms. Hurd's accounts of the violence and that Ms. Hurd was a victim of domestic abuse. This testimony is contained in Dr. Banks' deposition transcript, which is Exhibit P. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Banks' testimony, stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment and for providing improper expert opinion. The court sustained the objections on the grounds that the testimony about the abuse was hearsay and that Dr. Banks' testimony that Ms. Hurd was a victim of domestic abuse was improper expert opinion. Connell Cowan, on April 29, 2022, the defendant attempted to, attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. Connell Cowan, a clinical psychologist who worked with Ms. Hurd. Dr. Cowan testified that in the therapy session, Ms. Hurd reported abuse by Mr. Depp, including text messages and medical notes, where Ms. Hurd reported in December 2015 that, quote, Johnny did a number on me, end quote. This testimony is contained in Dr. Cowan's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit Q. It is also contained in Dr. Cowan's medical notes in Exhibit R at Depp 9122 through 23, and is contained in text messages that are Exhibits S and T. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Cowan's testimony, stating it was hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on the ground that the testimony about the abuse was hearsay. Alan Blaustein. On April 29, 2022, the defendant attempted to designate certain portions of the deposition testimony for trial of Dr. Alan Blaustein, a clinical psychologist who worked with Mr. Depp. Dr. Blaustein testified that in the therapy sessions, Mr. Depp reported that he had cut himself as a child and burned himself with cigarettes. Dr. Blaustein also testified about the drugs that Mr. Depp was on, as reported to him by Ms. Lloyd. This testimony is contained in Dr. Blaustein's deposition transcript, which is Exhibit U. This information was also contained in emails, which are Exhibits V, W, and X. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Blaustein's testimony regarding the cutting and burning himself as speculation, and the testimony regarding the drugs Mr. Depp was taking as hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on these grounds. Bonnie Jacobs. On May 4, 2022, the defendant attempted to introduce into evidence the treatment notes of Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, a clinical psychologist who worked with Ms. Hurd. The treatment notes show Ms. Hurd reporting abuse by Mr. Depp, including sexual violence. The treatment notes are Exhibit Y, and based on the court's ruling, the defendant did not call Bonnie Jacobs as a witness. Mr. Depp objected to Dr. Jacobs' notes as hearsay that did not fall into any exceptions, including statements for purposes of medical treatment. The court sustained the objections on those grounds. I have some more. Give me a moment. As long as you don't just keep turning every page in that book. No, it is not. I'm not staying for that. It is not. Okay. The U.K. judgment. On April 29, 2022, Ms. Hurd moved to allow evidence and questioning regarding the U.K. judgment and for admission of the judgment itself, which is Exhibit Z. 
In support for a motion, Ms. Hurd argued that Mr. Depp had opened the door to the admission of the judgment by presenting evidence of damages after the date of the judgment on November 2nd, 2020. For example, Ms. Hurd observed that Mr. Depp had sought damages for losing his role in Pirates of the Caribbean 6, a movie that had not yet been made. Ms. Hurd further observed that Mr. Depp testified that the op-ed had caused him and his family irreparable harm, there, thereby suggesting that his reputational harm had continued to the present. Ms. Hurd noted that Mr. Depp's expert designation indicated Michael Spindler relied on Mr. Depp's earnings from 2019 to 2021 when reaching his opinion, which resulted in an amendment to the designation. Ultimately, the court found that Mr. Depp had not opened the door to the admission of the UK judgment and overruled the motion, which the court did again today with Mr. Banya's opinions. Finally, Adam Berkovici, on May 19th, 2022, Ms. Hurd attempted to call Adam Berkovici, who was an expert in the policing and Los Angeles Police Department policing of domestic violence calls for service. Mr. Berkovici would have testified to his qualifications in the field of policing and LAPD policing of domestic violence calls for service as follows, and further outlined in Ms. Hurd's fourth supplemental and rebuttal disclosures dated March 31st, 2022. Mr. Berkovici spent 30 years with the LAPD, retiring in 2012 at the rank of lieutenant. He has extensive experience as a patrol officer, field supervisor, uniformed watch commander, both as sergeant second and lieutenant one, along with multiple assignments as an officer in charge, lieutenant second of specialized detective units. During his tenure with the LAPD, Mr. Berkovici held numerous positions directly responding to and overseeing subordinate officers' responses to the domestic violence calls for service, including as a patrol officer, supervisor, watch commander, and assistant watch commander. And actually this, Your Honor, is a, the person who prepared this prepared a longer brief of what he was going to say. I can, is it okay to submit it rather than hearing me read it all? Any objection to that? No objection. Okay. Okay. That's fine. And with that, that's proper. Okay. You just scared me with the size of that. No, I understand. Okay. All right. That's fine. If you can get Jamie our copy of it, we'll make sure it becomes part of the record as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Do you have any proffers, Mr. Chu, that you need to, at this point? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. All right. Then I think there's just a couple of things I need from you. Like tomorrow, let me, by the end of the day tomorrow, if I could get clean jury instructions without the sites on them for the ones that have been admitted, and also the verdict forms as well, if that worked out. Okay. Your Honor, we sent revised jury instructions to them yesterday morning and a revised verdict form today. So I'm just waiting to get back. Okay. Sure. We'll coordinate. All right. Thank you. And you're working with Jamie about some exhibits. There's some that were, both sides noted that were in evidence that are not. So I want to make sure everybody gets everything cleared up. You're caught up? Okay. Good. All right. Just keep that going so we can get that, make sure that's taken care of. As far as time left, Sammy, today, I can give you a rough estimate for two reasons. One, you had some depositions, so make sure you give the breakdowns to Sammy about those. And two, Sammy wasn't here today. He had a mandatory CLE that he had to do. So I just did a rough estimate, and I want to qualify that as a rough estimate. But it looks like the plaintiff has used about five hours today, and the defendant used about an hour and 15 minutes is what I have. Okay. And again, that's rough estimates, so don't expect them to be the same. But Sammy's going to get to it this evening and send you an email this evening with the actual accurate times. Okay. Anything else? No, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning. You too. Thank you. All rise.